Okay, welcome everyone to this PhD defense here at the Department of Design Sciences. Um, we're a number of people here in the room. Welcome, and uh, I can see on YouTube there are also uh, 30 YouTube screens with uh, a possibility of uh, a maximum number of 50 on, on each screen. Not too crowded. Welcome also to you distant viewers. And welcome to the examination committee in various places. Uh, my name is uh, Jakob Lundahl. I'm an associate professor here at Aerosol Technology and have been appointed by the faculty to be uh, chairman of the DEPENS. So I will provide you with uh, information about the participants, uh, guide you through the act and make sure that uh, the re formal requirements are met. So, to begin with, we have the respondent, Karin Löfven, PhD student at Division of Ergonomics and Aerosol Technology. She will defend her thesis. It's a real tongue wrister, so I will only say the title once. Exposing the exposures, assessing occupational aerosol exposures and their possible health, effect, health and toxicological effects. Uh, as opponent, the Faculty of Engineering has appointed Dr. Mar Viana, um, who is senior staff researcher at the Environmental Geochemistry and Atmospheric Research Institute. Um, at, um, at the Research Institute of Environmental Assessment and Water Research in Spain. Did I get it right? <laughs> uh, Dr. Mar's main research interests are in air quality, atmospheric aerosols, exposure, mitigation strategies, indoor air quality, source apportionment, and occupational exposures to nanomaterials. So it's a quite good fit, I think, with Karin's PhD work. Dr. Moore has published more than 120 peer-reviewed research articles and more than 20 book chapters. And for those interested in, in uh, publication metrics, she has a very good H index of 61. Supervisor of fourth PhD thesis. Uh, then I would like to say welcome to the examination committee. We have uh, Don Nordbeck, who is present here. Uh, he's from professor from associate professor at uh, Uppsala University. We have uh, Professor Lena Palmbe from Karolinska Institutet and Dr. Christoph Asberg from the Institute of Energy and Environmental Technology in Duisburg. Welcome. And then we have uh, examination committee deputy members. Um, Associate Professor Martin Magnusson from solid state physics here at Lund University and Professor Christina Stenström from nuclear physics, also Lund University. Then I would like to present uh, Karin's supervisors. Uh, main supervisor is uh, Professor Anders Gudmundsson. <laughs> well, um, Co-supervisor, Associate Professor Anneta Witzbecken and Dr. Christina Isaacson and Dr. Maria Helmer. I think that's all I should present. Okay, the procedure of the defense. To begin with, the respondent, Karin Lubin, she will be given the opportunity to present her errata uh, to the published thesis. Thereafter, Dr. Marr will provide uh, us with a short overview of the scientific area and put the thesis a bit into broader context. Then Karin will make a short overview of her thesis. After this, there will be a short break, just a few minutes. And those of you who do not have the possibility to stay, well, like, can leave and, uh, and we can all stretch our legs a bit. After the break, uh, we'll start with questions and discussion. And uh, it begins with the opponent and Karin who will discuss. And then there is an opportunity for the examination committee to ask Additional questions if needed. And finally, 
uh, it's it's open for the audience also to ask questions. And for those of you who watch this on, on YouTube, you ask questions by sending them by an, with an email to me. And I think you can see my email address in, in the title just below the, the video. Um, and then after all this, it's closure of the act. The ex examination committee uh, and supervisors are meeting separately to, to uh, make their verdict and decision about the whole thing. And uh, the rest can mingle here. There would be some coffee and, and some, yes, snacks. And uh, after a while, uh, when the decision is made, it, it will be announced to everyone. Okay, so let's begin. And first of all, Karen, uh, do you have any, any errata to your thesis that you would like to tell us? Yes, uh, I just have a few things that I found in the thesis and uh, almost all of them are just some minor spelling or wording things. But there is one thing where the less than greater than sign is in the, the wrong direction. So this could be worth noting. But I also think that the uh, context of the sentence makes it uh, uh, clear anyway. But uh, this was the errata that I had. And I think for those who are in, present in the room, uh, you can find it on a separate paper. Yeah, so that was it. Thank you, Karin. And then uh, Dr. Marr, we leave uh, the screen to you. Okay, thank you very much. Let me see uh, first how I can share my screen. There we go. Can you see it? Nope. Um, well, in theory, I'm sharing it now. <laughs> yeah, can you? Yes, Mar, we can see it. Now? Okay. Great. Christoph, still no? I can't see it either. I think you need to stop sharing the screen from, from Lund, or is that correct? I can't see anything anyway. Okay. Let's give it a moment, see if someone can, can check that. Yes, now I can works. see. Yeah. Okay. One one question. Can you see my my mouse? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, then I'm all set. So uh, first thing, thank you. To uh, I would like to thank uh, Karen and her supervisors for giving me the opportunity to act as a, an opponent in this thesis, which was which was a uh, very very interesting to read, as we will discuss um, later. It's my first time as a in a thesis in Sweden, so I hope I I can get the role of the opponent right with this with this overview. So um, let's see. Uh, to start with, the, I was uh, I was asked to put it into context of why we are studying this issue of of the exposures and and particles and and health impacts. And the first reason is mainly health, as we can see. I think this is this chart puts it very well into context. This is from the Health Effects Institute in the US, but it is the global ranking of risk factors by num total number of deaths for all causes, for all ages, all sexes. And we can see that ambient air pollution, ambient particulate matter, is the sixth cause of global death, of, of premature death globally. So we see that this is a problem, clear problem of health. We look at ambient air pollution, but also household air pollution at the eighth, at the eighth position. And then very closely together, we find down here occupational exposures at the same level of occupational injury, which we know is not small, and even ozone, which also Karen has discussed in her thesis. So this is clearly a health, the exposures to particles is a health relevant issue. Now, this is mostly for ambient air, but if we look at occupational settings, then we can see that it is also highly relevant. According to the same study and published in The Lancet, Occupational exposure to particles, to gases, or all kinds of, uh, of uh, fumes uh, in the air in occupational settings are accountable for 0.3 million deaths, premature deaths annually. 
and almost 9 million disability adjusted life years. So again, this is the reason why the uh, main health issue, main health reason why we should be looking at these issues. But these are not only health reasons, these are also economic reasons. This is a slide, an infographic by the European Commission, and we can see that in addition to premature mortality, health, health effects, we can see that these have impacts in economic terms, more, around 4 billion euros in healthcare spent for this, for, for air pollution related health uh, injuries. And also in terms of occupational, we're talking here about work days lost, around 16 billion euros lost in work days. So this is also an economic driver, an industrial driver, and it is also calling the population for action. As you can see here, almost 72% of the population, sorry, I'm moving my screen. 72% of the Europeans want action on this issue. So this is something that we should be definitely working on, like, like Karen has done in the thesis. So when we look at particles, uh, we'll try to describe how we have an uh, issue here with, with uh, not terminologies, but the, the way that different uh, research communities refer to almost the same problem. When we look at aerosol science, in the aerosol science field, we talk usually about coarse particles, which are PM10, below 10 microns, PM2.5, the particles are, which are below 2.5 microns, and PM1, particles below 1 micron. If we look at occupational uh, research and occupational hygiene, we have different size fractions. We talk about the respirable fraction, which is below four microns, so it would be the equivalent to PM4. We have the thoracic fraction, which is below 10, which would be then equivalent to PM10, and the inhalable fraction, which are the total suspended particles. And then if we go to the smaller size fractions, we have the issue of nanoparticles or ultrafine particles here. So I wrote them in the same line because it's actually referring to the same term, mostly particles below 100 nanometers. But in the nanotechnology research field, these are usually referred to as nanoparticles, whereas in the more uh, aerosol research field, they're referred to usually as ultrafine particles. So these are the ones that we are mostly going to be dealing uh, with now in the framework of, of, the, of Karen's thesis. Just to give you an idea what kind of particles we're talking about when we talk about ultrafines or nanoparticles, this is the size distribution that we can find typically. And if we look at the nanoparticles, like I said, ultrafine or nanoparticles, this is the kind of aerosols that we're, th that we're looking at. Welding fumes, uh, tobacco fumes, diesel fumes, cooking fumes. So these are not coarse particles like dust or road dust that we can see from in, in the cities or with suspension from parks. These are really... Uh, derived from either combustion processes like traffic, like uh, like tobacco smoke, or uh, high energy industrial processes such as such as welding, and these are really very fine aerosols with strong health impacts. Now, again, this is an issue of terminology. We're referring to mostly the same thing, so we will look at. But it's difficult to find uh, to standardize this kind of uh, of terms. When we talk about nanoparticles, there's a European definition from the from the Commission. Which talks, which says that a nanomaterial is a natural, incidental, or manufactured material containing particles, blah, 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 one or more dimensions in the size of 1 to 100 nanometers. So it definitely goes to the uh, size below 100, but they can be natural, incidental, or they can be manufactured. If we look at the definition of ultrafine particles, which comes from an ISO, from an ISO uh, norm, then we simply have the reference to the size, a particle size, a particle sized about 100 nanometers in diameter or less. So this is all the information we have, not no information about this, the, the, the source, the, the formation process, nothing. So this also complicates the things a little bit. Now, when we're looking at occupational exposures to ultrafines and nanoparticles, then we usually, uh, this is what we usually uh, can find. Uh, if we make it, if we discuss this in more practical, more applied terms. When we look at, when we talk about nanoparticles, we usually are referring to particles which are intentionally manufactured and they have specific characteristics, let's say, uh, or chemical properties. Let's say we're talking about nano titanium dioxide for cosmetic applications, or we're talking about graphene for uh, industrial applications, or any kind of material that has been intentionally produced and that is being either produced or applied in a certain industrial process. If we look at ultrafine particles, on the other hand, then these are usually referred to uh, when we talk about particles which are unintentionally produced. 
So this means during a given industrial process where high energy is, is uh, inputted, let's say welding or cutting or braiding material, then particles are formed unintentionally, they're released to the workplace. And uh, because they are formed unintentionally, they do not have a predetermined size or morphology or chemical composition. They are a byproduct, they are a collateral of a certain industrial process. So this complicates, of course, their, their characterization. Some examples, if we're talking about nanoparticles, we have nanoparticle production or application in suspension of spraying or handling of, of nanopowders. But if we're talking about ultrafine particles, then they can be produced by, let's say, mechanical processes, combustion processes, thermal processes, like metal casting, laser ablation. There are tons of different industrial processes that can generate this kind of, of uh, ultrafine particle emissions. And now, thanks to Karen's thesis, we have more information about other processes that generate ultrafine particles. Let's say cleaning activities, we have handling and cleaning. No, sorry, these are referring to, in her thesis, to, to nanoparticles. But spraying and all of these activities now have been uh, characterized in this thesis. So when we want to look, of course, we like I started saying that we want to look at these exposures to understand their health impacts, because these are health hazards. So if we want to understand the health impacts, we need to look at all of these aspects that are here in this in this uh, graph. We, 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 need, we need to look to know the atmospheric chemistry or the reactions that happen in the in the atmosphere. We need to be dealing with exposure science. We need to look at how this affects human exposure and the impacts from the point of view in epidemiology. And I like very much this graph that uh, Karen has in her thesis, which shows precisely this all the different steps, all the different uh, issues that we need to look at if we want to know how these exposures impact our health. So we need to know not only the emission source, but also the concentrations that they generate, how the workers are exposed, what doses and what, in, or what uptake. So there are a multitude of issues that we need to take into account. It is, it is a, broad, a broad spectrum that we need to look at to understand from the particle formation and release to the health impacts. And during this entire process, there are a lot of gaps, which is what I would like to, to discuss now. So let's see, from the point of view, first of exposure and release. The main gap is the, in, when we're looking at occupational exposures, is the multiplicity of microenvironments. There are so many types of industries, so many types of industrial processes, and even then later in cleaning activities like we saw in the thesis. So there are so many ways that these particles can be formed and released and impact exposures that we have strong difficulties to cover the whole, the whole to, to have a, a good picture of, of it all. So this is why a lot of work is needed in this, in this kind of, in this field. And also very relevant, I find also from the point of view of Karen's thesis, is that we need to look at this in real world scenarios. I mean, we could use a lot of models and we could use uh, exposure chambers and, 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 and um, release, uh, what is it called? Uh, try to, to uh, reproduce really scenarios in the lab, but we will always have a lot of other uncertainties that we're not taking into account all of the parameters that, than when we go to the actual workplace. So in the workplace, we have the big advantage that we're looking at the real world exposures, definitely. We have many disadvantages, of course, that the environment is not controllable, that the industrial activities are not fully controllable. We might go one day and certain process is not working, is not ongoing because the machine broke, because the programming has changed. We have limited access to the plants. This, I'm sure most of you have experienced, that uh, we try to access the plant and, and, the, and the company might not be interested or might not grant access to a certain process. And then we have issues with confidentiality. And after you get all the work done, then uh, you might not be able to publish it or to communicate the work. So there are strong limitations about using real world scenarios, but at least in my view, they do not outweigh, outweigh the main advantage, which is that we can really characterize the real world exposures which is what was done here also by Karen. Another gap that we have to look into is health impacts. Recently, there's a slide from, from Professor Flan Kelly, where he was telling us that if we look at, uh, at coarse particles, at ambient air particles, this study from the Health Effects Institute again, showed us that there is no uh, evidence. This is a very, very interesting way of putting it, but. There is no direct evidence that can say is that any one component, any one type of, chem of particles is, re is um, responsible for the health effects. So we cannot say it's only traffic-related particles, it's only uh, particles coming from ship emissions. 
there is not a one single component that can be blamed for this health effect. So then one could think, okay, maybe it's a, a question of size. It's those, only the small particles. But then we have another Hay report, which says that evidence does not support that ultrafine particles alone can be responsible for the health effects that we see. Therefore, it's not only the size, because the, part, the sizes above the ultrafine fraction are also relevant for health effects. But we do know that the really, really small ones, the ultrafine ones, have health effects in the sense that they can translocate, which is moved from the respiratory system to other body organs through the bloodstream. And this is what showed what is shown by uh, Flaminka say in this slide, where we do, we can see gold nanoparticles, and they were instead of they were found in the bloodstream, and the red ones are the small particle exposures, and the blue ones are the coarse particle exposures. And we can see that after 28 days, we do see in the bloodstream gold nanoparticles, we, whereas we don't see the coarse particles. So we can, this is evidence that they do translocate. And similarly here, coarse particles are not found in the bloodstream, whereas the fine ones are. So we all, then again, we need to look at healthy things. Uh, more gaps that we have, monitoring tools. We have tons of instruments, lots of fancy instruments, but each of them look at different particle parameters, uh, characteristics. Characteristics. Some look at, um, at uh, the number concentration, others look at the, at the lung deposited surface area, others look at mass, Others allow us to collect the particles and look at them in the microscope, but they all have different size cuts, as you can see here, from 4 nanometers to 1500, this one from 10 to 700, from 0.3 to 10 microns. So this, uh, there's a recommendation from this white paper that I, that I showed here that we should go at least down to 10 nanometers. But again, this is only recommendation. We have no standard methods. We have no um, standard strategy to monitor, even though we have recommendations that the community is using. But there's still a lot of work to be done regarding monitoring tools. And because we don't have a standards for monitoring tools, we also don't have standards for occupational exposures for this issue of the ultrafines and the nanoparticles. For coarse particles, we have, we have clear standards, like 10 milligrams or 3 milligrams per cubic meter in terms of mass. And for certain uh, types of nanomaterials, of these manufactured nanomaterials, like nano titanium dioxide or nanofibers, we have some limit values. But in the case of ultrafine particles, uh, we do not really have more than recommendations, which would be this case of like 20, sorry, 20,000 particles per cubic centimeter or 40,000 particles per cubic centimeter, depending on their density. But we do not have limit values to compare with. This means that actually then the, the, the companies do not need to, to comply with any occupational limits for these particles. And this means that they don't see frequently the need to, to make this kind of exposure assessments. And this is what limits the access that I was referring to earlier for, for research, that we have difficulty in, in accessing the plants to carry out this kind of experiments. And last, uh, we also have risk regarding mitigation measures. We have seen uh, in Karen's thesis, or we will see now in the presentation, the uh, a reference to the hierarchy of controls, where when you find exposures, there's a hierarchy of what kind of measures should be implemented to, to uh, reduce these uh, exposures. But uh, when we look at the literature regarding their effectiveness, uh, well, there's still the issue of their effectiveness regarding whether we're exposed to microparticles or to nanoparticles. So we can wear masks, we, we can wear a mask, but we don't really know the effectiveness for the smaller particles. We're now unfortunately seeing this issue also with, with COVID. We, have, we can have dermal exposures. We need to see what kind of gloves are relevant for which kind of nanoparticles or even the clothing. It will depend on the kind of particles that you're being exposed to. So there is also a lot of work to, done, to be done in, um, in this field. And uh, yeah, so basically, uh, I think I hope to have shown you now that when we're looking at exposure assessments and occupational exposures, we have a lot of gaps that are still uh, remaining and where work needs to be done. And fortunately, this is where Karen's thesis comes in, who uh, carried out a great amount of work addressing all of these topics. So. Um, so I think it will be very interesting now to, to see her results. So that's it from, from my side. Thank you very much. And uh, Karen, now I think it's over to you.
Thank you very much for this excellent introduction. And then, Karen, you can present your thesis. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Let's start with a question that many of you might be thinking about. How many more years are you planning to work? The answer to this question can be determined by the conditions of your occupational environment. Your work may be physically strenuous or require you to be highly focused in stressful situations. Or you just might be affected by something so basic as the air you breathe. The air can contain aerosols, particles and gases that can have adverse health effects if you inhale them. And the introduction of new types of products into different occupational environments uh, can generate harm for aerosols, uh, regardless of if these products have a low or high technological level. So which occupational groups are at risk for these types of exposures? Well, there are of course many different ones. Uh, for example, mine workers exposed to stone dust or uh, track drivers exposed to diesel exhaust. Uh, but in my thesis work, I've been focusing on two other important occupational groups, cleaning workers and workers in the nanotechnology industry. Cleaning workers make up a large occupational group worldwide uh, in which the use of low-tech spray products have been introduced. And one risk factor for these workers is the handling uh, of a range of different uh, chemical cleaning products. And some epidemiological studies have shown that this occupational group have a higher risk of developing uh, skin, eye, and airway problems such as asthma. Within the nanotechnology industry, new high-tech products and materials are continuously being introduced into the occupational environment. And one risk factor with these are all the new and uh, sometimes unknown properties that these can have for the human health. And one nanomaterial in specific, uh, for specific concern is uh, nanofibers, which can have similar effects as asbestos, which can cause um, uh, fibrosis and different types of lung cancers. Um, so how can we study these exposures and the health effects? Uh, as Mars showed, there is a sequence of events that are required for an aerosol emission source to be able to induce human health effect. Uh, the source has to generate a particle concentration high enough uh, to constitute a, worker, a personal worker exposure, and this in turn has to be uh, create a dose high enough to be able to induce the human health effect. And the different parts of, uh, of this sequence can be studied with um, uh, different types of studies. So epidemiological studies can statistically link uh, concentrations uh, uh, yeah, aerosol concentrations with uh, human health, uh, um, yeah, human health effects. Uh, while aerosol studies can uh, uh, be used to measure more specifically the concentrations and the uh, worker exposure. Uh, specific exposures can then be connected through clinical studies with specific health outcomes. And toxicological studies can be used to uh, determine more specifically at what dose levels that these effects arise and also what underlying mechanisms that cause uh, these effects. And in my thesis work, I have uh, in all of my papers in some way included aerosol studies, uh, but paper two have also included a clinical study, in my case, a human chamber exposure study. And uh, uh, paper, paper five have uh, included a toxicological study uh, in which I have uh, used an in vitro cell toxicity study. Uh, so the main aim of my research have been to provide a basis for the implementation of improvements of their working environments for these two occupational groups. And the more specific objectives have included uh, the development of uh, measuring methodologies and determining uh, aerosol emissions and exposures within the cleaning occupation uh, and to assess and apply existing measuring methodologies and evaluate different uh, work processes within the nanotechnology industry. Some additional objectives have been to evaluate potential health effects and compare different exposure scenarios within the cleaning occupation and to uh, evaluate potential toxicological effects and uh, compare different nanotoxicological um, methodologies. And these objectives have been addressed in paper one and two for the cleaning occupation and in uh, paper three, four and five 
uh, for the nanotechnology industry. And uh, my thesis is based on these five papers. And with my research being very multidisciplinary, this has often been uh, the result of a team effort, which you can see in my author lists. And this is also why I'm going to refer to we uh, when I talk about uh, the studies and the results. So we have used an overall methodological approach divided into three subcategories of contextual information gathering, aerosol characterization, and health and toxicity assessments. Uh, the information gathered had, have included uh, what kind of cleaning sprays that are used and what type of self-reported symptoms that the cleaning workers uh, report, uh, and also what type of materials that are used within the nanotechnology industry and what the processes that they are performing. The aerosol characterization have included both uh, offline and online particle measurements, as well as uh, some uh, online gas um, measurements uh, within the cleaning occupation and some uh, surface uh, contamination assessments uh, within the nanotechnology industry. And for the health and toxicity assessments, uh, they have included some calculation uh, of the respiratory deposition fractions, uh, medical assessments and ergonomic load measurements within the cleaning occupation and the nanotoxicological response study uh, for the <laughs> nanotechnology industry. Um, and more specifically, the methods used in the cleaning, uh, for the cleaning environment have included an initial phone inquiry with the cleaning companies, followed by a survey conducted together uh, with um, uh, professional cleaning workers. After this, we have also done aerosol studies where we have uh, developed uh, a method to measure total airborne mass fraction, and I will come back to that a little bit later. Um, and we have also done some more uh, specific particle measurements in both the nanometer and micrometer uh, size range. And as I mentioned before, we did also did a human chamber exposure study where we uh, furnished uh, the chamber that we have in our lab as a bathroom and uh, let some volunteering cleaning workers and non-cleaning workers clean this bathroom with different types of uh, cleaning methods. Um, and uh, they... During one exposure day, they uh, cleaned this bathroom during three uh, half hours. And before and after each of these uh, uh, half hour cleaning sessions, uh, we conducted medical assessments. And the three types of um, uh, methods that they were using included spray, foam, and uh, chemical free, chemical free uh, water cloth uh, method. So the spraying method uh, consisted of spraying the um, a chemical directly onto the surface and then wiping down the surface with a, a microfiber cloth. Uh, the foaming um, method then consisted of switching out the cleaning, um, uh, the spraying nozzle with a foaming nozzle and then generating the foam directly into the microfiber cloth and then wiping down the surface with that. Uh, and finally, the water cloth method uh, was uh, cons consisted of that they were only using these water pre-moisted microfiber cloths to wipe down the surfaces. In addition to these aerosol measurements and the medical assessments during this study, we also included ergonomic measurements uh, to get uh, the most comprehensive view possible of the exposure situation for these uh, cleaning workers. And in, the in this picture, you can see one of our volunteers with all these uh, uh, sensors attached to her. For the nanotechnology environments, uh, first of all, we gathered some uh, data or some information from the companies uh, that we were uh, going to visit uh, about what type of materials and what type of processes that they were um, yeah, handling and, and uh, using. And after that, we did workplace emission and exposure measurements uh, with uh, both offline measurements, uh, including filter samplings, uh, uh, and online measurements in both the nanometer and the micrometer size range. And we f used um, uh, several different measurement zones, uh, including uh, the emission zone, which is defined as uh, uh, just a few centimeters away from the potential particle source. Uh, then we also included a background zone several meters away from the emission zone. We also measured in the personal breathing zone of the worker, which is defined as uh, 30 centimeters around the nose and mouth of the worker. And in this picture, you can see the inlets of the um, samplers that are placed on this worker. And we also included measurements in the supply air, which is the uh, air coming into the uh, room. And I will come back to that also a little bit later. And then we also did a toxicological study uh, to see, uh, to test different types of uh, nanotoxicity uh, systems. And uh, the first one is a traditionally 
um, submerged system where you uh, have the growth medium uh, on both the bottom of the cells and on top of the cells. Uh, but then you can also use a more refined uh, system, uh, which is called an air liquid interface uh, cell exposure system, uh, where you only have the growth medium on the bottom of the cells, and then the cells are exposed to the air, so that it more simulates the conditions of your lung. And in our study, we included two submerged systems, uh, one where we added the nanoparticles directly into the growth medium, and one where we let the, uh, let the cells grow at air-liquid interface first, and then at the time of exposure, we added the nanoparticles in a salt solution. Uh, but then for the air-liquid interface exposures, we used the NACIF system, uh, in which, which contains a, a well plate where uh, we can actually expose 24 wells at the same time. And the big advantage with this system is that you can expose the cells directly to an aerosol. So now for some of the results from the cleaning occupational environment. Uh, as I mentioned, we did a survey and we informed 300 workers and we got 225 answers, uh, which is a response rate of 75%. And our uh, main question during for this survey was, uh, do the cleaning workers use cleaning sprays in their work? And yes, they do. 77% answered that they do use sprays uh, during their work. So the next question is, do they experience any symptoms when they are using these um, uh, cleaning sprays? And yes, they do. Uh, some of the, or almost half of them, 48%, answered that they do uh, experience one or more symptoms during uh, work with cleaning sprays. And this can be compared to only 17% of them uh, answering that they experience symptoms when they are cleaning with other methods than sprays. And during this survey, we also found out that the most frequently reported symptom was nasal symptoms. The workers also reported that they are using both commercially available products and uh, uh, products only available to professional cleaning workers. And based on this survey, we chose uh, seven products to be uh, further analyzed uh, with uh, some aerosol measurements. And we included both um, products from this commercially available brand and from the professional available brand. So as I mentioned before, we developed a method to measure total airborne mass fraction, which is uh, basically how much of the liquid that you're spraying out from the cleaning bottle uh, that remains airborne and does not reach the intended surface. Um, so this makes up the total airborne mass fraction. And we chose three types of products. So it was uh, bathroom, uh, sorry, uh, window cleaning sprays, bathroom cleaning sprays, and uh, so-called universal cleaning sprays. Here it's shown as a table. <laughs> and uh, we also showed, uh, we also used both uh, commercial and pro uh, professionally available products. And as you can see here, we we found a great variability between different types of products. It actually varied with uh, an order of magnitude from uh, below 3% to over 30% for different types of products. And the products that showed the highest airborne mass fraction was the ones with, which had an adjustable nozzle. So we, we um, assumed that this adjustability was one factor that uh, affected the total airborne mass fraction. What we also saw was that the window cleaning sprays generally had a higher total airborne mass fraction than the uh, universal cleaning sprays. And we wanted to uh, test this even further if this was due to the nozzle of the bottle or if it uh, was due to the chemical content. Uh, so we took a um, window cleaning spray bottle and filled it with the uh, cleaning liquid from the universal spray. Um, and this is what you see here. So the two gray bars is the same bottle and the two circles is the same chemical. So what we can see is that the nozzle actually is the driving force behind the high total airborne mass fraction. And then we also did the, the opposite where we took the um, uh, universal spray bottle and filled it with the cleaning liquid from the window cleaning spray. And even though it's not as clear, you can still see that it's the uh, nozzle of the bottle that is the driving force behind the uh, total airborne mass fraction. So for the human chamber exposure study, we chose these three professional products um, to be included in that study. And what can be worth noting is that these were all so-called mild products, so they didn't contain any chlorine or bleach or ammonia. So during the human chamber exposure study, we tested these three different cleaning methods, and we measured both the particle concentration and the volatile organic compound gas concentration. 
And what we could see was that the particle concentration greatly increased during the use of sprays. But when we switched to the foaming method, we could see a great reduction in the particle concentration. The same trend can also, could also be seen for the VOC gas concentration, uh, even though the reduction uh, during foam use is not as great. And just to explain the graphs a little bit more, uh, the first 30 minutes uh, is the exposure in the chamber, and after that, the uh, test subjects left the chamber and we, we went, ventilated the chamber, uh, which is why you see the decrease in the, in the graph. And with some further calculations, uh, we also found that um, the particle concentration was seven times lower during foam use compared to spray, while the VOC gas concentration was 2.5 times lower uh, during um, uh, foam use instead of spray. Uh, the medical assessment that gave the greatest uh, or the strongest effect was the peak nasal inspiratory flow measurements, which you can see in the picture here. And this is where you place a mask over your nose and mouth, and then you breathe in as much and as fast as you can through your nose. And this is a measure of how obstructed you are uh, in the nose. And just as a reminder, we did this measurement six times during one day, so before and after each of these half-hour cleaning sessions. And I'm going to first show you just the chemical free uh, control exposure. Uh, and just on the y-axis, we have the um, uh, PNIF difference uh, compared to the morning value. So the morning value is zero, and then it's the uh, difference uh, of the PNIF value during the day. And what you can see here is that this, uh, these PNIF values increases over the day, and this have also been shown uh, in other studies when you don't have any chemical exposure. When our subjects used the um, cleaning sprays, uh, we can see a great reduction of this increase, uh, as much as uh, about 10%, and this was also statistically significantly different. Um, when they were using the foam, we could still see a little bit of a reduction, but not as great as with the um, uh, cleaning spray, and also not uh, significantly different from the water cloth method. Okay, so for some of the results from the nanotechnology environment, uh, first of all, we found out that uh, several of, of the companies were using fibrous nanomaterials. In fact, three different types of uh, fibrous nanomaterials were used at the companies that we visited, and also some graphene and some other types of nanomaterial. Some of the processes that they were uh, handling uh, included um, production of engineered nanomaterials and uh, manual equipment cleaning, which you can see uh, on the picture here. Uh, it also included some different types of handling of the nanomaterial, for example, weighing and mixing different types of dry powder, and also some testing of uh, products containing engineered nanomaterial. In this picture, you can see uh, an abrasion test. And since uh, the nanofibers are of uh, specific interest, uh, I'm going to focus a little bit on those here. Uh, what we showed was that, was I mentioned that uh, the companies uh, handled three types of um, nanofibers, and we could actually find all of these three in the emission zone of the uh, filter samples that we use. So you, what you see here is the electron microscopy images of these three types of nanowires. And the gallium arsenide nanowires and the titanium dioxide nanofibers were also actually find, found in the personal breeding zone of the worker. And uh, in combination with these filter samples, we did also online measurements to be able to um, determine what exact process that generated these particles. And for the gallium arsenide nanowires, uh, we found that the uh, manual uh, reactor cleaning uh, was um, one uh, process that generated uh, the gallium arsenide nanowires. And uh, what you can see here that, uh, that you see these um, emission peaks in both the nanometer and the micrometer size range. When we uh, studied the titanium dioxide nanofiber, uh, handling, we showed uh, we could show that the weighing and mixing of the powder in the beginning of the work task uh, generated these uh, emission peaks. But what you see here is that we can only see this emission zone peak uh, in the micrometer size range and not in the nanometer size range, which uh, suggests that uh, it can be a good idea to not only include nanometer size range measurements, even though this is the nanotechnology industry, uh, since a lot of the emissions happens as uh, uh, agglomerates of the, the nanofibers or nanoparticles. Uh, as I mentioned before, we also used four different measurement zones, and this may seem excessive, but we did show that this is an important uh, part. Um, in this figure, 
yes, in this figure, uh, you can see the, um, the emission zone and the background zone uh, particle peaks that appear in the room uh, at this facility. But what you also see is the particle peak from the supply air. And at this facility, we were measuring the supply air uh, like five meters up in the ceiling from the ventilation duct. And uh, since we do see a particle increase in this supply air, um, we can conclude that well, if we hadn't included these supply air measurements, we could have mistaken the other peaks from the room to be a nanoparticle emission event, even though the supply air shows that these particles actually infiltrated from the outside air. So for the comparison of the toxicological methods, uh, we use the human alveolar epithelial cells, A459 cells, A A549 cells. Uh, and expose them to um, zinc oxide nanoparticles. And I'm going to show um, one, of, uh, one example of the uh, results that we retrieved, which is the release of the pro-inflammatory cytokine MTP1. And I'm including uh, the low and the medium dose uh, exposures for all three systems. And it was only the medium dose at the NOSIF system why doesn't it? Uh... Ah, no, okay. Uh, so it was only the medium dose at the nausea system uh, that showed a significant difference uh, towards uh, the unexposed cells. And we can also further show that uh, it, uh, it was significantly different towards the other two submerged systems. So this led us to be, uh, assume that uh, the more physiologically uh, realistic nausea system uh, can uh, detect uh, an effect uh, of these cells uh, or the cell exposures at a lower uh, nanoparticle concentration than the traditionally submerged systems. So now when we have exposed the exposures, what can we do it up about them? As uh, Mar mentioned, uh, NIOSH have this um, uh, hierarchy of controls uh, where the first step is elimination. And within the cleaning occupation, this elimination step can include to completely eliminate the chemicals used and just use these uh, pre -moist, water pre-moisted microfiber cloths. Uh, however, in some cases, the uh, chemicals are needed. So uh, then you instead could consider substitution, where you can, for example, switch from uh, a spraying chemical application method to a foaming chemical uh, uh, application method to reduce the worker exposure. Within the nanotechnology industry, uh, it's not as easy to eliminate or substitute uh, nanoparticles or nanomaterials uh, since it is often the specific properties of them that you are after, even though you should consider the safe by design approach when you are producing new types of materials. But here you can instead use engineering controls, where you, for example, do some of the processes in fume hoods, or you encapsulate some of the processes to uh, reduce the exposure for the worker. If this is not enough, you can also uh, uh, apply administrative controls where you change the way a certain process is performed to reduce the exposures. And if, uh, if the exposures cannot be reduced enough, uh, the worker themselves have to use personal protective equipment uh, to protect them from uh, any harmful exposures. So did I uh, answer my aim and objectives? Well, we're in the cleaning occupational environment. We showed, first of all, that the use of contextual information uh, in before doing any other types of studies is very important to get the whole realistic exposure uh, or the whole realistic situation of the of the occupation. And we also managed to develop a, a technique to measure the total labor mass fraction, which we used to determine that there is a great variability between different types of products, uh, between three and 30% uh, of the total labor uh, generates the total labor mass fraction. Uh, we also show that the nose is the most affected by spray use and that the PNIF measurements uh, show the uh, decrease of, of about 10% during spray use compared to the chemical-free method. Uh, and also by switching from a spraying me method to a foaming method, you can decrease both the aerosol concentration and the uh, nose effects. Within the nanotechnology industry, we show that the combination of offline and online methods is uh, important if you want to characterize the whole exposure situation. Uh, and also th uh, that we did manage to measure the fibrous nanomaterials uh, that were handled in both the emission zones and the personal breathing zone of the worker. 
Furthermore, we also showed that the nanoparticle uh, um, exposure can induce the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and that the more physiologically realistic NASIF system is uh, more sensitive than the traditionally submerged systems. So all this was done to promote safe working environments and more specifically the exposure data and hazard toxicity information can be used to improve risk assessments and uh, for different types of models, uh, models and control banning tools where you can estimate the worker exposure if you cannot measure it. The comparisons and evaluations of different types of measuring techniques uh, can be used to, in recommendations to occupational hygienists and also for uh, continued research within this field. And the identification of processes causing uh, different exposure uh, events can be used by uh, the companies to implement suitable mitigation systems. So I think I did answer my main aim, and I just want to say stay safe at work. Thank you very much, Karin. I noticed here the number of YouTube watchers have been increasing, so your defense is going viral. Um, we'll have a, a short break. I think we meet here precisely, we begin again precisely quarter past. So uh, that would be enough to take some coffee, maybe. Or, and uh, yes, stretch your legs.
so it's it's time to start again that that watch is actually a bit optimistic um it's 17 past and do we have uh, Dr. Marviana, Christoph Asbach, Lena Palmbe here? Yes, yes, I'm here. There we go. Thank you. So uh, then I leave uh, the discussion to, to you, Karin and, and Mar. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Let me just one second organize the window so that I can see my notes. And there. There we go. I cannot see Karen though. I don't know if I'm supposed to. Yes, I think so. Let me see. I can see the committee. Oh, there, there you are. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, thanks again. Let's see. Um, thank you. Thank you, Karen, for the presentation. That was very clear, uh, very, very useful. Actually, like the whole of your of your thesis, I, I wanted to congratulate you first on, on that because the thesis is very clearly written, very scientifically robust, and, and yet it is easy to, to understand. It is it is reader friendly and uh, straight to the point, which is also not 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 frequently the case. So I, I, I did appreciate that, and I guess everybody who read the thesis did too. So congratulations on, on that. Thank you. Also on the fact of the, I, I think, at least I saw very few, it was carefully edited, I saw very few typos, very few er errors, and uh, the few that there were, you, you, you presented now, actually, before, before the defense. So, so that was really, really nice work. So uh, before we start, I would like to ask you just a, a detail. Uh, how long did the work take you? How, how What was the duration of, of your whole PhD uh, work? Uh, well, I've been a PhD student since uh, October of 2015, uh, but some of the work from the in the first article was actually done during my master thesis work, which was uh, half a year before that. So yeah, well, well, and then the last few months I only written the thesis. So yeah, about five years. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, no, definitely a lot, a lot of work. I also uh, appreciated at, at the beginning in the first pages that you you mentioned that you changed your research field when you were working on the thesis. Actually, right, that you came from engineering nanoscience and then moved into aerosol science. I think. Uh, this this gives added value because it, it it broadens definitely your spectrum. It increases the multidisciplinarity of your research, which shows again in your in the actual work in the thesis. So this is also a nice a nice combination. Um, let's see. Well, you have uh, we presented your thesis as a compendium of five publications, which are uh, uh, three of them under review, but in the last stages as we discussed the other day. So, and they're also in, in good journals related to the topic. So I think this already gives, um, gives value to the thesis. There's not much that can be said in, uh, about the work. If it's already published and it's, and it's accepted by the scientific community, then it's, it's already uh, validated. I wanted to ask you about the role, your role a bit in each, of the, in each of the papers to start with. I know you describe it in the thesis, but of course, it's always more difficult to, to really understand because in, in one of them, for example, you're not first author, but the, the, the text that you described was similar, like actively participated. Mm. I don't know how you forward it in the design yeah. of the experimental study. So can you tell us a bit about the, the, the different papers and which one you feel closest to your heart and, and why? <laughs> oh, wow. That, I think that's a bit tough. But um, the, my role in different papers, paper one uh, is... Uh, it's my work, the whole thing. It's the combination of my thesis work and then some work that I did as a PhD student. And everything in that one was done by me. And then, of course, with collaborations of my supervisors, but it's me who have done the work. Uh, and in paper two, it's that's uh, the, the biggest group of collaborators. That's the, um, uh, I've done uh, a lot of the aerosol uh, uh, analysis and measurements and uh, 
the medical um, assessments were done by uh, uh, research nurse and uh, medical doctor, uh, but then I analyzed the medical data together with them and also together with a statistician, statistician or what's the word? Um, uh, so, but it's me who have done the majority of the analysis of the medical data, uh, but in collaboration with them. Uh, and then the ergonomics measurements was my uh, colleagues who did that. And they also did a data analysis for that. So that's uh, what I know least about. Um, for paper three, where I'm not the uh, main author, uh, it's uh, mainly due to that this is, was a study where we did um, measurements at the same company, but at two different uh, time points before and after the upscaling of their nanotechnology production. And during their first measurements, I, I wasn't employed as an, a PhD student yet, so I wasn't a part of the first measurements that uh, there. And then I only did some data analysis for, for the first part of that study uh, afterwards. Uh, but then the second part of the study, I was uh, the main uh, contributor in the measurements and the data analysis of that part. Uh, but there we also have a lot of the uh, collaborators who other, some colleagues of mine did the SEM analysis and also some other colleagues did the um, chemical analysis uh, and uh, so on. Uh, but I have been a part of the um, discussion of the results, of course. Um, and for paper four, I did uh, the majority of uh, all the measurements on both of those um, measurements. Um, or both of those uh, workplaces that we did the measurements in. Uh, of course, together also with some colleagues, it's not possible to do it by yourself. Uh, but I was the responsible uh, one and also main contributor in that and also the data analysis. But the same with paper three and four is that the SEM analysis have been done by uh, colleagues of mine and also the chemical um, analysis have also been done by colleagues of mine. Um, but uh, I've been a part of the discussion uh, regarding the results. Uh, and for the final paper, that was um, there I was supervising a master thesis student. So uh, we did some of the work together and then she did a lot of the practical work, but we also had a lot of the of uh, discussions uh, about uh, yeah, how to design the study, how to conduct the study, and also about the results. Um, so, but in that paper, I would say that it has been a, a close collaboration uh, between me and the second author. Because, uh, yeah, she was my mother, she's a student first, and then my project assistant. Mm. So, yeah, do you have okay. any more questions about that? No, no, sure. Thank you. I have a, a similar, that definitely shows your direct involvement in, 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 in all of them. So it's just, we always need to ask to, to really verify and check how, how much the, the, the student was involved. Mm, similarly, or at least related to that, Moving on to your, your aims and object, on objectives, you mentioned from the beginning that your thesis focuses on two very different target groups of, of workers, cleaning workers and uh, technology workers. And this is uh, sometimes difficult to, to integrate in a thesis when the two groups of, of uh, study, study groups are so different. Mm. So, um, but in, in, in your case, I think it adds value again because it, it brings this discussion that I'm interested in about ultrafines and nanoparticles and different methodologies that can be applied in each of them. But uh, can you tell us a bit how it came to be? So how, how did, you, you, did you find yourself studying on the one hand cleaning workers and on the other hand uh, technology workers? Uh, well, I think that uh, it's a combination of both that um, uh, the master thesis work was done with, within the cleaning spray project. And so uh, I had already, when I applied for a master thesis project, um, been interested in studying something um, real that I could relate to and that could be valued for the community. Uh, but then with my nanotechnology, uh, nanoengineering background, I was also interested in... Um, uh, these nano safety issues. Um, so I think that that was a great combination that was possible uh, when they announced the um, PhD positions because there were a lot of uh, different projects uh, at the time uh, which was possible to be involved in. Um, so I, I think it was a combination of, of two interest areas. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. and, so. two, and two projects, I guess, that were ongoing at the same time so you could merge yes. your results in both of them. Yeah. Okay. 
And then uh, maybe can you let us know or, or elaborate a bit more then on the um, your objectives? The first one is to develop a measuring methodology to determine the aerosol emission and exposure characteristics. So this, of course, usually the objectives respond to a research gap. I I also mentioned in my in the introduction about the the issue of the multiplicity of microenvironments and how we need data on actual real world environments. Can you elaborate a bit more on the, the gap analysis, the gap that you were trying to fill with this with this objective? So, if there isn't, if there is a lack of exposure data in these two communities, the cleaning workers and the exposure and the sorry, the nanotech workers, can you explain a bit why you think this is, or, or what is the situation that you have found maybe in Sweden and how it com could compare to other areas, to other regions? Mm. Uh, for the um, cleaning workers, uh, some first of all, the majority of the well, first of all, there is not a lot of studies about cleaning workers and those who are uh, exist. They are mainly these types of epidemiological epidemiological studies, uh, where you um, uh, mostly ask a questionnaire to see like how what type of uh, work do they do and if they experience, uh, experience symptoms or if, if they uh, develop asthma, if you continue these questionnaire studies. Uh, but there were actually a few um, aerosol measurements, but then they had only done uh, the gas analysis. So they had only measured the um, VOC uh, part of the data. And it was also quite scarce data. Uh, but there is one study that is quite similar to ours where they also have uh, measured in a um, uh, bathroom setting kind of uh, and, and tested it so on. But uh, it there was no particle data um, for the, the cleaning spray use. Um, so uh, I think that that was one knowledge gap that we have filled a bit more with our, uh, with our studies. Um, and for the more of the symptoms and health effects, uh, I think that there was no no direct color, cor, color, correlation with um, uh, the exposure and uh, an outcome, an effect outcome uh, before it was, it have mainly been these, um, uh, yeah, uh, st epidemiological studies. So I think that what we showed was that uh, we could, un under controlled situations or conditions, uh, generate an exposure and then directly look at the acute effects uh, of that type of exposure. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and what about the nanotech companies? Was it a, do you think the limitation of the data is, is an issue of access or how, what was your experience? Was it easy to access the, the facilities or, or to, to contact the companies regarding the zinc nanoparticles, for example, or the abrasion? Uh, instrumentation? Yeah, well, uh, well, we had some issues with, <laughs> with the companies, especially, like, I think we, we did have the ones that we uh, measured at, at, the, at the end were actually companies that were interested in looking more specifically into their uh, environments. Uh, but the issue have been, uh, a lot of the issues have been to actually be able to schedule uh, visits with, with with them, a, a few of my plans have been rescheduled multiple times during my PhD studies. So this has also contributed a bit to, um, yeah, to do the, to a little bit of delay uh, in in the uh, experimental work. Uh, but um, and also some, uh, yeah, I think that that's actually the most difficult part to actually be able to schedule something and that they also do the processes that they want to um, have analyzed or that we want to measure. Uh, uh, for, for because the, um, uh, at some company that we were at, we the plan was to measure uh, spe some specific processes, but when we got there, uh, those processes were not running or uh, they were not able to to conduct them. So that was uh, a small problem. But but I think that and and also one thing with the community as a whole, it is a problem that, especially in a lot of other countries, it's not possible to visit the real companies. So a lot, a lot of the studies are done in these pilot studies that you mentioned, and that or pilot plants, or or that when you're simulating certain uh, exposures. And I think that one, one, uh, well, there are there are a few studies where where they can visit and do exposure measurements at uh, specific real companies. But I think that that's one of the strengths of our studies that we have been able to actually be out in the real companies and see how they actually do their work and, and measure on the real processes that they perform. 
Um, so yeah. I think that this is a one of question. And, and another thing is also this with the fibrous uh, nanomaterials. There is some types of nanomaterials that have been wildly characterized. For example, nowadays CNTs and um, uh, titanium dioxide nano, uh, nanoparticles. Uh, but I think that uh, the interesting parts of our study have been these with the fibrous nanomaterials and also actually the, the graphene uh, measurements. Yeah, actually the, the fibers is something that I would like to, to discuss with you a bit later. So mm -hmm. definitely. Um, let's move on to the methodology a bit in, in general, the instrumentation and your, and your study design. I was wondering uh, if whether your study design in each of the cases was driven by the instrumentation available. Let's say you have a, a certain number of instruments in your lab and you design your study around them. Or did you have the possibility of thinking, okay, I would need, definitely I need an SMPS for this, but I don't have one. And then you need to go looking for it. I mean, was it instrument driven or you could design the concept in the way you liked it and then try to get the instrumentation that you needed? Uh, it has actually been a little bit of both, uh, I think. We do have a quite extensive um, instrument pool in, in our lab and with our collaborators. So it has been a possibility to to use most of the instruments that we want. Uh, but I think, so in some ways, it has been instrument driven that this is what we have available, but we do have quite a lot of instruments available. But in, a, in one case, it actually was that I wished for an instrument and we could uh, buy it actually for uh, the cleaning spray products because during the, uh, in paper one, uh, we didn't do any VOC uh, measurements, uh, which we, or we tried. We borrowed an, uh, uh, an instrument, <clears throat> but it wasn't, um, yeah, it wasn't uh, good enough or, or what to say, it wasn't sensitive enough, enough. So we actually, before the human chamber exposure study, we actually bought an instrument that could measure the VOCs on a, on a better uh, concentration uh, scale. Uh, so that, then I was able to wish for an instrument that we could buy. Um, but um, yeah, so I think it has been a combination of both. Um, okay, so I just wanted to see if you were able to, uh, if you had had the chance to decide what you wanted and then and gather. So yeah. in a way to look for what the best tool will be for your job and then make mm -hmm. it happen. For the okay. nanotechnology uh, measurements at the companies, uh, there. Well, the issue also, we, we do have a lot of instruments, but we are also quite a lot of researchers using those instruments. So one limitation is also that there is a lot of ongoing uh, projects at the same time. So yeah. maybe not all instruments are uh, useful at the same time. And uh, yeah, and so for the nanotechnology um, companies, especially for the personal um, exposure measurements, I might have wanted to use maybe some other uh, instruments uh, that were not uh, available at all times. I see. This is something that I wanted to ask you too about the actual instruments. Let's say, for example, one curiosity, although we will talk a bit later about the SMPS further, uh, was I was, if I understood it correctly, you took it to one of the companies. So, uh, well, but what about the radioactive source? Did you have no trouble with the actual moving it around? Because this is something we come across very frequently. We, that's why we now have a, a, an X-ray source because we were not able to move around the um, radioactive source. Did you have this problem or how, or how did you manage to move it around? And uh, this is actually the only measurement uh, where I wasn't involved. So this, okay. where the SMPS was used at the company was the, the first part of uh, paper three. Uh, so that was, I was not involved in the actual measurements of that one. Uh, okay. But we usually do, we can move the SMPSs uh, around to different measurement stations. So we do have a, a protocol to follow with the radio radioactive sources also. Okay, so I, I don't think that that was an, an issue. Um, but yeah, I, sorry, I wasn't involved in that. No worries, you, you probably then have a different kind of source. Okay, what about the other, the more portable instruments, the P-Track, the side pack, the nano tracer and protector? I did not see or I missed it in your thesis, uh, any validation or intercomparison exercises. Did you perform this kind to, to ensure the quality of the data beforehand? Uh, yeah, well, we did um, during the nano uh, technology measurements at the companies, we did uh, these types of um, side by side uh, runs with the instruments that we, we were using to see that they weren't uh, differencing uh, too much. And we did that during the days, usually during lunch breaks, uh, so that they, like during the days that we were using them, we ran them side by side to see that there wasn't a big difference. So we have done that for 
I know it, that we did it for the nano tracers, and we have also done it um, for some of the others, I think. Um, but uh, we didn't do any any specific validations, especially for the the side pack. We haven't uh, calibrated uh, it uh, for a specific um, particle uh, source or something. So that's where that one we're use, mainly using for an estimate estimation or an detection of the exposures, and maybe not for the actual um, value uh, of mm -hmm. the particle concentration. I see, because yeah, indeed, if you if you made comparisons be in between units, then you would have good data for for relative uh, for mapping, for example, for relative comparisons between units. But uh, I think it would also be interesting to have the absolute comparison with maybe not a reference. If there is no reference for PM10, yes, there would be, but at least for more uh, robust uh, stationary counterparts with a with a CPC in the case of the nano tracer or yeah. the part detector. That if uh, that would give you a better measure of the of the absolute concentration, no? not, not only a qualitative comparison mm. between instruments, but more of a quantitative to be able to assess the concentrations. Yeah, and with the, the nano tracers and CPC, we did, and with the micro tholometers and the real tholometer, uh, the real the bigger tholometer, <laughs> uh, we did. Uh, but with the protector, actually, I didn't do any because we that was the only one we had. No, I can't say that. But um, we did. We didn't do. I haven't done anything with that one actually. So mm -hmm. I think that that one we can mostly use as a as a as an estimation. Uh, but the nano tracers and the and the uh, microtholometers we did run uh, with the other one. But that okay. was also with no, not with the nanoparticles that were present in the workplace. As so, yeah. So we didn't do it with the correct uh, particles uh, in that sense. So. Yeah, I guess we we haven't validated it in the right way or in the no, sure, most detailed way. No, but I think even at least having a comparison offsite, and even if it's with a different kind of aerosol, but at least having the comparison between the portable instrument and the more robust uh, counterpart is is highly relevant. Even if you like you're saying, even if you are not able to do it for the test, the specific test aerosol, which would be the ideal case scenario. But at least you can have a, a better comparison. Mm. Okay, one issue that I also wanted to uh, to discuss with you is the issue of fibers, because um, uh, well, I, I myself don't have very much direct experience. I have I have measured with fibers in a couple of locations, but not as uh, frequently as other types of particles. But uh, I was surprised that I didn't find, or maybe I missed it in your thesis, uh, any discussion about the limitation of the direct reading instruments. When challenged with fibers, and this is mm -hmm. a, an issue that is well known that it can, of mm. course, depending on the on the how the fiber enters the instrument, whether it can enter the instrument or mm. not, depending also on its length, how yeah. the instruments might overestimate particle diameter, therefore also overestimate particle mass, mm. and um, and then so how basically this impacts your exposure assessments. So can you tell us a bit about this and, and, and how you think your measurements could have been over or underestimated in certain parameters when you were looking at fibers? Mm. Uh, for the, um, uh, since we did the, fi um, the filter samplings uh, together with the online uh, measurements, we could uh, see how they were captured in the air and see if that we, and sometimes we were able to capture them as uh, single um, nanofibers and single nanowires, uh, but in some cases also as uh, larger agglomerates. And uh, I think that this, in comparison then with the, the online data we got from the direct reading instruments, uh, can be one way to, to look at these um, possible limitations and so on. So um, for... Um, as I showed in my presentation, also that uh, uh, we were able, in sometimes uh, measure the the more single uh, particles, uh, single um, nanofibers uh, with the uh, CPC, uh, and but in some cases the uh, the more the agglomerates were the dominating factor. So that was uh, what we could see with the the um, uh, APSs and and uh, in the larger ranges. So. Well, if you have the single um, uh, nanowires, they can uh, align with the uh, with the airflow and so on. But um, but the larger agglomerates are um, probably will um, uh, behave a little bit more like a, a larger particle. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I don't, now I a little bit lost my train of thought here, but... Um, That's okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, no, I saw also now in the presentation, you mentioned and you saw, you showed that uh, the titanium dioxide you found in the micro range, because mm. clearly then these agglomerated. Yeah, or, and we didn't see any, like from the uh, so, um, so, um, filter samples, uh, we didn't uh, find any like single titanium dioxide nanofibers for that mm -hmm. one. They were mostly agglomerated. And then this was not the, the opposite case was for the gallium marsenide mm. uh, particles, which you did see a single Yeah, the nanofibers could, but we could yeah. also found them, found them as uh, agglomerates, but there it was, we could also find them as single particles. Mm -hmm. Indeed, yeah. That's that's the one that I was wondering about then in the, in the, gra in the graph where you have with the CPC measurements there, wondering whether the number of concentration could have been overestimated um, with uh, with with the fibers in the ca in the case of gallium arsenide, um, mm. and this is always a an, an uncertainty that you are are going to have in this case yeah. with this kind of measurements. But what is really relevant, and at least from uh, the way I see it, is in this case to have the the TM images to have the microscopy analysis that can give you the real confirmation of what kind of particles you you have there. Yeah. And we did also, I don't remember if I mentioned this in the presentation, but we did also do the chemical analysis of the gallium and arsenide from uh, other filter samples. And also for the titanium dioxide, we also did uh, chemical analysis to get, so we did it, get it as a mass concentration as well. Uh, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's presented in the tables in the paper. Yeah. And actually that was one question that I had also regarding the titanium dioxide, because you wrote that uh, quantification of the titanium dioxide was not possible by SCPMS due to the fact that uh, titanium dioxide is poorly is a poorly soluble oxide. Uh, I don't know, but you now you also mentioned earlier that the chemical analysis were done by another team. So maybe you don't know how the or, or maybe you do how the analysis the the, the, the digestion was carried out because the because the sorry, there's a noise here. Sorry. Because uh, apologies, because we we do we do uh, analyze the titanium dioxide with uh, hydrofluoric acid, but I know that this is of course it is a dangerous uh, acid, so maybe not all the labs want to want to work with it. Mm -hmm. So do you know how this was uh, how this was done? Yeah, actually, we 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 never tried it with the ICPMS. We we mostly got uh, from the um, people that we were supposed to work with. Uh, we uh, got information from them that uh, they, yeah, so they didn't have the possibility to dissolve it with the materials that they had. So, but yeah. in Lund, we have the possibility to use the pixie analysis. So mm -hmm. that was what we did use, and uh, that turned out to be really uh, sensitive and and uh, good for our measurements. Uh, yeah. But I know that this is also a technique that is not available ev everywhere. But if you, I think I wrote it uh, that if you want to do it in, with the ICPMS, that um, you have to use uh, another uh, stronger solvent, or you can use this um, optical something. Uh, I don't now. I don't remember. I think I, yeah. I wrote it in the paper. Or XRF as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, also, we we we. Ah, I was interested with your with your total airborne mass fraction sampler. Maybe you can tell us a bit more how, how this came to be, whether whether you were directly involved in developing the sampler or not. And uh, actually, because I, I thought this could be very useful for other types of other types of, uh, of pollutants. In for example, now that there's that there's uh, all the rage about the microplastics, it could be a way to sample in the air. I don't know, maybe you can tell us a bit more how it came how it came to be. Well, this was actually, um, uh, we, we wanted specifically to measure on these uh, sprays and we wanted to know uh, how much how much remained in the air in the total of both the particles and gases. And we wanted a simple method so that we can do it uh, quickly and also easily determined. Uh, and this was a method where we, um, so it's it's really, it's very uh, simple, but it's very useful. So we, we um, and we tested a lot of different setups uh, for this, but basically you, we had a paper that we, or several papers that we attached to the wall, and then we were spraying against them. And then we were weighing, uh, just with a mass balance, uh, uh, weighing the, the bottle and the, the, these papers in, in a container before and after the spraying to determine how much of what we were spraying out from the bottle that actually reached the surface. 
Um, and uh, so it was not really a lot of advanced uh, uh, techniques involved okay. in this. It was just a, a scale and, and some, some uh, equipment. And I think that this was also what we were thinking was that it should be as easy as possible so that maybe regular uh, companies or, or someone who wanted to test uh, this could do it very easily without any um, uh, advanced technological instruments uh, in an in a advanced lab that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think I mentioned it in the thesis that uh, there is actually a group in, in Norway who adapted uh, this method that we were using so that they also did similar um, measurements with this easy technique. So it is useful for like cleaning sprays, but also other types of spraying products. But I think that you can't use it for like any regular, I think you need something to, uh, yeah, it's something well, to need, generate. Yeah, you need a direct source, but the, uh, yeah, like exactly. we have seen, and there are many, many uh, uh, industrial processes where you have this uh, this direct okay. source. And in, in, in this case, uh, your, your, these particles are somewhere in between uh, this ultrafine and, and the nanoparticle that I was mentioning because they're not, they're not uh, engineered, but at the same time, they're also not, uh, they're, they're generated by a specific process, but they are generated intentionally. So there's somewhere in between, but there are many processes where you have uh, unintentional production gen release of nanoparticles. Of ultrafine particles in this case, where you could use this method close to close to the process to to see what stays, which fraction stays airborne and which one doesn't. The the only issues I can see with that is that first of all that you need to be able to determine how much that you have from the beginning in that case, so that you have the if you doing the mass balance, so you can calculate it. And one issue that we had was with the scale. You have to have a scale that is sensitive enough to the low uh, difference in the um, uh, volume or the mass, uh, but also a scale that is able to measure uh, the mass of, for example, the cleaning spray bottle uh, together with the sensitivity. Uh, but we we adapted this a bit, and I, I described that in the um, in the paper how what sensitivities that we were using for the different uh, measurements. Yeah, so actually that was one of the things that when at least I was thinking when you read it that you might have a good sensitivity for the for the paper. But for the bottle, regarding uh, in, in relation to the small amount of product that is emitted, so I, I was wondering about the uncertainty of that. But uh, yeah, I see that, that that you worked on this. Yeah, and we actually to be able to do this, this was also something that I was trying out. We actually had to uh, pour out a lot of the liquid from the from the bottle, so we only because the you could the, the way the weight. We, we, uh, the scale that we had uh, could measure the whole bottle, but then it wasn't as sensitive as when you measure at a lower weight. So we could sure. set it, if we poured out a lot of the liquid and just kept a small amount left, then we could use it in the lower um, scale range or whatever, yeah. and then you could get a higher sensitivity. So it was, uh, we were able to measure uh, at the sensitivity level that we needed. And as I explained in the um, in the paper, we also had a, a margin. Uh, I think it was like the scale had 0 0.1 micrograms or something, and we were measuring. No, uh, okay, it, it's a, an order of a factor of 10 at least different. between yeah. the scale and what we actually were measuring. Yeah, I see. Okay, um, this is linked also to uh, we we discussed in some previous conversations. There's a there's a paper that I find interesting by uh, Stone et al. in, in 2017. Which is called nanomaterials, which refers to this issue about nanomaterials versus uh, ultrafine particles, in, and they they look at it from the point of view of toxicology analysis. And I wanted to discuss it with you very briefly uh, regarding uh, actually not not from the point of view of toxicology, but from the from the point of view of exposure. So, mm -hmm. what can we learn from both from each of the fields, from the nanotechnology field that can be applied to the ultrafine particle field, and vice versa? Now that we find in the ultrafines. And that we can do that. We could apply to um, to the nanotech, for example, from the point of view of sample format. I, I have found frequently that when we have, like in your paper five, you have uh, uh, powdered uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles. I guess they were powdered, right? Or in no, suspension? No, they were actually in a suspension. Yeah. Okay. So you have them in a suspension, so you can apply a specific method to characterize them or to to perform the toxicity, like like you did. But if we wanted to apply the same method to ultrafine particles found generated in the in the workplace, 
So uh, how how do you have any idea how this could affect like if we have a tool, let's say like the Nasif, which has a na na Nasif, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. System, you need to have a suspension to apply to the cells. But if you collect, if we go to workplace and we're collecting ultrafine particles on a filter, let's say for chemical analysis or for TEM, we have this problem. Okay, if we want to apply the same toxicity analysis, how can we extract the particles? And, and to keep, put them and make them in suspension to have uh, the toxicity. Or the other way around, if we have a suspension, but we want to characterize the chemistry, how do we extract the particles to uh, be able to put them on a filter and look at them with the pixie? So do you have any any thoughts on this? What, what have you learned from each of the fields that can help to the other one? Yeah, well... Um First of all, I think that one we have been discussing uh, with the native system that we have that the it is a, like a tabletop size of the instrument. So uh, we have been discussing if it could be possible to take it directly to the workplaces, so that we can so that you can expose the cells directly to the workplace air without having to collect them first and then uh, yeah dissolve them and then uh, resuspend them. Um, uh, to to get the exposure for the cells, so I think that this is one advantage uh, advantages with this system that it you possibly could take it to a, a workplace. We haven't done it yet, but uh, th this could be an option. But yeah, this is one of the the issues when you are collecting particles and then resuspending them, and uh, if you if you're keeping the toxicity or not. Um, the zinc oxide nanoparticles that we were using were uh, we bought them in this. Um, uh, uh, dioxide, uh, 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 yeah, deionized water uh, solution. Okay. So they were supposed to be, um, yeah, uh, uh, when you then generate it with the nebulizer, uh, it should have been the the, the real uh, nanoparticles. Yes. Of course, there can be some agglomerates and so on, but um, uh, yeah, so that was the, the point or, or the work with that. Uh, mm -hmm. I find that actually very interesting because this is an issue we, we have come across. Uh, the, it was very useful to see in your presentation the, the native system because I, I, I don't think I had seen the actual the actual thing, what it looks like. <laughs> and uh, it does seem portable, at least transportable. Transport and uh, yeah, I guess the main issue that you would have then is a question of air, of concentration, of, of, of yes. reaching the actual concentrations that are necessary. Yeah, for but we... Yes, but we do have actually we have in in the paper we didn't do it, but but we have have since then uh, tried uh, different uh, time samplings because in the paper we only did a one hour exposure, but after that we have also done a study where we did three hours exposures, and we have also thought about maybe doing a whole work shift of eight hours exposures because the the good thing with the NASF system is that it has its own has its own. Um, incubation system, kind of. So it has a, a humidifier that humidifies the the air and um, uh, and also a temperature control area. So you can have the 30, uh, 37 degrees uh, with the eighty five percent humidity, which is uh, corresponding to the to the lungs. Um, so and if you can keep that, uh, then you can transport it, and and you could probably possibly use the system as the incubator. The only problem with that, with that is that you have to have it connected all the time with a power source. You don't have to have anything other connected to it, but you have to have the power. Um, and what is also one issue that I think could be a problem if we move it to a workplace is that to get this humidifier to work so that you get 85% humidity, uh, you have to fill up um, this humidifier with um, deionized de water and you have to have quite a lot of water to be able to, maybe this is a design thing also in it, but to you have to cover uh, the tubing that is inside it. And we have tested out some different levels of these uh, waters because when it, when, if you follow the instructions and, and uh, pour in the amount of water that you're supposed to have, uh, you're almost at the limit. So if you then move it, you're, you're risking that you're um, uh, spilling out the water. Well, you close the system, of course, but then you can't tilt it or anything like that. So you can't really travel with it when it has the water in it. Uh, okay. But then maybe if we could adapt so that you can have a, less, a lower water level, and we have tried something. So we did try it with a little bit of a lower uh, water level than 
what is recommended, and that worked fine. Uh, but I think that the transportation with the water and the incubator uh, could be the, mo the most problematic uh, if you do take it to a, a workplace uh, and then want to bring back the cells to the lab. Um, so that's I one. See. Is it is it a commercial system or is it a custom designed in, in Lund? No, uh, it's... Uh, well, I think maybe semi-commercial. Uh, it we we have bought it from the the manufacturers in uh, somewhere. Uh, yeah. No, just thinking if, if there's or... if it's custom design, then you have the possibility to make this kind of engineering changes to decide the volume of water that you need. But if it's commercial, yeah. then it would, of course would take. A, yeah, but I think it, it's yeah. Things. That's why I said semi-commercial because I think that they are still like they they are developing things, and I think that at the moment there are. There are some groups that have this system, but it's not uh, like a, a very available. Uh, so I think that you can also kind of um, uh, wish for uh, some things with it. Mm -hmm. and, but we haven't custom built it in Lund. We bought it from the from the manufacturers. I see. Okay. Thank you. Let me see. Now I'm getting to the each of the papers. Let's see about paper one. Um, Ah, yeah, the, well, also help now to see, I had a question about the stainless steel exposure chamber, but um, regarding the light, but I saw now in, a, in the bigger picture that it has a big, a big window, no, because here you, you're yes. discussing the issue of new particle formation that you, that you found. Yeah. But uh, if uh, I, at first I imagined that this was a closed, fully closed stainless steel chamber and that then you would have less interaction with light and therefore less uh, particle formation. But um, but now I saw that there's this big window, so it, it really mimics uh, the situation in a, in a hotel bathroom or, or something like this with, with big exposure to light, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I, I actually hadn't thought about the, the light um, that much, but it's the, it's actually the window, it's it, like the chamber is, it, it is inside the room, so the window is not for outside. So it's not a lot of... Uh, well, outside air <laughs> or light, but it's the uh, yeah. But and we can, we also have light inside the chamber, uh, mm -hmm. so it's not dark when you. Go. Yeah, I, I can. When I was reading, I kind of imagined it like a, like a smaller tabletop chamber, so they wouldn't have light, lighting inside. But then now I saw that it was, it was more. It was a light life size with lights, and then you walk in. Mm -hmm. um, there was this question about the SMPS that I had. I don't know. It said that the you did not see increases in particle number with the SMPS, so its use was discontinued. But at the same time, you saw new particle formation, and you saw it actually with the um, the fast with scanning, the, with the, exactly with the yep. DMS and with the APS, which basically mm -hmm. the DMS starts from 50 nanometers, and in this way. Five, it, I think. Five, five nanometers. Even. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And it would have even then definitely overlapped with the with the size range of the SMPS. So I was wondering why you didn't see any any particle formation or any the, the SMPS did not detect these particles. If, I think um, maybe I, this was maybe a little bit unclear in the paper, but uh, this was actually at two different um, measurements. So where it stated that we didn't use the um, SMPS is that when we when we were only measuring with the, the primary particles of the spray, so we didn't have any ozone and we didn't look at this um, uh, new particle formation. So when we did these initial oh, okay. pa particle characterizations, uh, only measuring the particle size distribution and so on, then we couldn't detect any any increases with the SMPS. But when we later on were doing the the uh, new particle formation measurements, uh, we did actually have it's not included in the paper, but we did actually use both the DMS and the SMPS for that, and we did see an increase in the SMPS. But since that has a so long um, uh, sampling time, sampling time. Uh, it it wasn't. As clear, you could see it clearly, more clearly with the DMS. Um, so that was why we have included that in the paper. So, so when we have the new particle formation, of course, then the SMPS can see those particles as well. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, Otherwise, I, I yeah, wasn't understanding sorry, that, what was going on. So it was a question yeah. of, of temporal resolution, basically, of the SMPS mm -hmm. measurements. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, here I had the issue of the uncertainty of the CAN for the for the total aerosol mass fraction, so which is the same that we have discussed already. Mm, let me see. 
Uh, to move to paper two, I have here, um, uh, you uh, wanted to look at the health impacts, paper two, but your, uh, the average age of the cleaning workers and the non-cleaning workers was very different. Yeah. So the, the cleaning work, the non-cleaning workers were much younger on average, 24 years, as opposed to 41. Mm -hmm. Did you take this into account and how for your identification and the, and the quantification of the symptoms? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, this was uh, like one of the main issues that we had with the human ex uh, chamber exposure study. The goal from the beginning was to have only uh, professional cleaning workers joining uh, this human exposure study. Uh, but I think I discussed it a bit in the in the thesis um, uh, that uh, we had it, it. It was a challenge to recruit uh, such a lot of uh, cleaning workers for them to be able to take off work or find replacements or to come to us and do it uh, at three time points. So when we we had oh, we recruited um, 11, if I remember correctly, 11 cleaning workers. And uh, then we, but we wanted to have 18 uh, in total from the beginning. But so uh, uh, we, we got a little bit <laughs> desperate and thought maybe we could do a control group instead mm -hmm. uh, of since we didn't find, we couldn't find any more uh, cleaning workers that wanted to uh, or had the time to uh, participate. Uh, so that was why we wanted to recruit a control group. And uh, this was also a little bit different, uh, difficult. And the majority of the ones that we got were these uh, younger, most of them uh, students or, or um uh, early in their uh, professional careers, but not as cleaning workers. Um, so this, these were the ones that were available and had the time to participate in the study at the time. We also had a limited amount of time to recruit this uh, so-called control group um, due to that. The goal from the beginning was to have only cleaning workers, but and so we had already started the study and realized that we, we weren't... Um, able to recruit all of them. So that's why we had a limited time frame of recruiting more. And that was why we got this. But yeah, yeah so I, I, I'm, I am aware that we have a big um, uh, age difference. But in the statistical analysis, especially with um, um, multiple, uh, now I lost the word, um, the linear mixed model uh, that we used for the uh, symptoms and the um, uh, NIF and butte measurements over the course of the day, uh, we have adjusted for the, uh, first of all, uh, all the uh, all the participants are their own controls. So they're, they're, you're controlling against their own uh, morning values mm -hmm. the whole time. Uh, but then also in that statistical analysis, they are also uh, controlled for the uh, age and I think something else also, but I don't remember now. But the age is um, controlled for in the in the statistical model. Um, so see, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Then there's definitely that's that's what I was wanting to to hear that you did take into account this take this into account in the in the linear mixed model. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, of course, we're looking at health effects and we're looking at people of 41 years versus people of 24. Mm -hmm. Then you you would expect a difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, let me continue. Uh, this is more of a, of a general question. You, you conclude in this paper that the exposures when you use the foam are lower than when you use uh, the spray. Mm -hmm. And uh, but there is, and you, you mentioned this also, but I wonder if you have more, if you could tell us a bit more. Of course, then there's the issue of dose. I do not know the if you have looked and maybe maybe the foam takes a lot longer to work with or is less effective, and therefore you need to use more product than for you could have a higher dose and end up with stronger health effects than using the spray. I'm just uh, thinking out loud. I, if it could be the worst case scenario that the spray is the most efficient and you work the, the worker works the fastest with it, so the dose inhale will be much lower than using a foam which has lower emissions but longer time. Have you considered this or yeah. checked in any way? Well, uh, very interesting question. Um, I, we have considered it in, in one way and uh, maybe not in another, but uh, what we did do was to try to, because we haven't analyzed anything like how efficiently you can clean with a different. I have actually gotten this question when I talked to the cleaning workers afterwards also, that like, sure. can we, can we, do we know that it's uh, as efficient? And I can't answer that because we didn't do any measurements of like how efficiently you clean. And the chamber was always clean. So we didn't like dirty it up or anything before <laughs> they cleaned it. So they cleaned clean surfaces. Uh, but uh, what we did do was that 
to to get the same uh, approximately the same exposure we did a, a small measurements where we tried to measure uh, how how many spray pulses and how many foam pulses generates the same amount of liquid from the bottle mm -hmm. um, so we actually adjusted because they all the participants were given instructions on like now you're going to use the window cleaning sprays this many times on this window and this many times on this uh, uh, mirror, for example. But when we switched up to the foaming method, these instructions were slightly adjusted uh, so that the number of, um, well, foaming pulses were a little bit different between uh, different during the spray uh, method and the foam method to try to generate the approximately the same uh, amount of liquid used. But what we actually find at, found at the end, which is also, I think, uh, written in the, in the paper, is that we actually, the average value was actually a little bit higher uh, for the foaming method. So they actually used a little bit more liquid, even though we had given them these very exact instructions. So mm -hmm. the, the average amount of liquid used during the foaming method was actually a little bit higher than during spray use. And even though they had more liquid used, the effects were still less. Mm -hmm. So I think that that even more clearly shows that the application method is is important. It's very relevant. Okay. Uh, just curiosity before we move on to the next paper, uh, when you were look when you were recruiting the the non cleaning workers, I suppose you must have that these the younger people from the university, especially. I guess you must have found. I guess it wasn't so easy and you must have incentivized them in a way, right? Because I'm imagining we, we have trouble recruiting students when we want to make them run around the town, the city to, to measure black carbon. Ima I, I'm just thinking, imagining, telling them that I want to recruit them to clean a toilet. <laughs> I don't see how that would go down. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, yes, this it was a bit, a bit difficult, but they uh, they they did um, they did receive uh, some uh, compensation, like a few a small amount, which is allowed in the, for the ethical um, considerations. Uh, but but it, I think also some of them were like interested in participating in the study, and yeah, and they also yeah. So I, I think that. Like yeah, it it can, it was difficult to recruit them, but uh, I think also for especially for maybe young uh, people at the university, it can be interesting to participate in a research project also. Um, and as I said, it they didn't clean any dirty thing, as, yeah. so everything was clean when they were cleaning it. So it wasn't like they now you have to clean this very dirty bathroom, so. <laughs> the faculty bathroom or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Let's see, uh, paper three. I had never heard of this aero taxi to produce nano wires. Do you know? Do you know actually how it works? A bit. Could you tell us a bit how it works? Mm -hmm. And what kind of metals it can be used with, for example? Uh, yes. Well, the regular production of uh, nano wires can be used with uh, a lot of different metals. Usually, you combine this in the, the three and five. Um, in the periodic system uh, columns of uh, materials uh, mm -hmm. to get these nanowires. Uh, actually, I, I don't know if you can use all of these materials in the aerotaxi. Uh, I actually don't know that. Uh, but the aerotaxi method is because uh, you're... Well, maybe you should be able to, but uh, yeah, I, I can't answer that uh, uh, exactly. So, But the aerotaxi okay. method, uh, you're... Um, because the regular way you do it is that you're generating the seed particle, which in uh, in this case have been gold, um, and uh, you attach or you, you put it on a surface, and then you add these um, gases. Uh, in this case, uh, the arsine and uh, gallium gases. Is it called gallium when it's a gas? Uh, no, I'm not sure. But yes, you add the the uh, the gas form of it uh, so that it. Um, and then they can uh, start this uh, process of, of with, with the help of the seed particle, uh, they can uh, uh, start growing these uh, and attaching these um, uh, atoms to the uh, to build this um, um, uh, nano wire. Mm -hmm. And when you do it in the aerotax seed, then you generate the particle, uh, the, you generate these seed uh, gold particles as an aerosol instead. So that's the why it's called aerotaxi instead of epitaxi. Um, so uh, you generate these gold particles so that they are in a in a, in a suspend, uh, suspended in air uh, or in a not in air but I think it's argon gas or something. Um, mm -hmm. 
and then you add add the gases so that in the in the when they are airborne uh, these seed particles the gases can attach and then these uh, atoms can uh, build in this uh, while they are airborne so that's kind of and i think the major advantage with this is that you can have a higher throughput of uh, producing these particles than if you're producing them from directly from a substrate. Uh, I think this oh, was my maybe very overview, simple answer to this. But I, so I'm not an expert in this, but I think that this is no, my no. understanding well, it's of it. It's interesting to to know how it works. I see, and uh, well, as then therefore as it is produced, uh, I guess in a in an enclosed chamber, of course you have little emissions to the air and little chance for for exposures, which is what you found. Yes, and, uh, during the production. Yeah, during uh, the yeah. production. Yeah. Mm. So you saw that the main exposure route was during cleaning and maintenance procedures, right? Yes. And um, this is interesting because we have also seen this in, 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 in several workplace locations where the actual process is fine. Because also, I mean, that's what the companies are most interested in, you know, because it's where they save uh, any uh, any uh, expenses. If they're, if they're producing a material and they're losing it by fugitive emissions, it doesn't make any sense. So the process is usually well enclosed and well protected. But then we have the problem of the cleaning and the maintenance operations. Mm. And uh, we have also seen that uh, you, you reviewed several studies in the literature. You referenced them, which was very nice for nanotech facilities. Um, so then what, what is your suggestion? What can be done if, if we need to, to do perform this maintenance and these cleaning operations of these facilities? Uh, do you have any suggestions as to which methods are better or worse? I mean, in, in my experience, we've seen that uh, dusting, well, dusting, no, uh, sweeping, that's the word, mm -hmm. with uh, industrial machinery. I mean, it's a, my, my experience and um, what I'm thinking about is a very different uh, scenario that, than you're describing, but this was a large industrial plant and they had these um, uh, mechanical sweepers that a person was driving in and, and they were sweeping. This, for example, was a, the highest exposure generator in our case. And also when, uh, in another case, more related to nano, where we had an exposure chamber, the moment that the, that the exhaust ventilation started to work to remove the particles, this is when we had the highest exposures. Mm -hmm. So um, in, based on this, in, so if, if we're generating exposures when we're cleaning, what, what is it that we, can, that we can do to improve this? What would be your recommendation for the companies for the, in this specific case, for example? Yeah, um, for the for the aerotaxi company, we we did see because they it's 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 a, quite an advanced machinery to produce these particles. They also have a lot of different parts that are supposed to be cleaned and uh, maintained. And what we did see was that when they are cleaning the part which are generating these seed particles, uh, for some reason which I can't really explain, some of it was done uh, out in the lab on a bench and mm -hmm. some of the parts what's were done in a fume hood or in a loft bench and we saw a very uh, a rapid decrease in the particle emissions and exposures when they were doing the cleaning inside a fume hood so the first recommendation if if you're um demounting parts of the system which you are then cleaning do all of that part uh, cleaning parts in uh, a fume hood for example or a, a loft bench show that uh, you you reduce the um, uh, emissions to the worker or the exposure to the worker. So if you because and that can be, I think that that's quite easily a, able to do that when you have parts which you are uh, taking away from the actual uh, machinery. Uh, but then some parts, for so for example, like the reactor, the reactor part, you can't really move it anywhere. Um, and also some of the filter exchanges and stuff you have to do in place where they are seated. Uh, and I think that in those places, well, local uh, process ventilation sources could possibly be, I, I'm not exactly sure what happened when you do, did this exhaust ventilation, then if you got a, real, a higher exposure, then I think it sounds a little bit uh, weird or mm. like, yeah, because I would think that if you put a, a process ventilator, a ventilation, maybe right over or next to uh, the part which you are uh, cleaning, that could help with decreasing the, the um, uh, um, exposure to the worker during that specific task. But then I think it's also, you, you probably can't uh, reduce all of those exposures, which is why the personal protective equipment is needed for that specific part then. Um, no, in, in our case, actually, we what we interpreted was that the particles that were being that we were seeing in the in the um, 
that were being resuspended were actually not close to the process, but even further away inside the chamber. So maybe in this case, the exhaust was too high and it was resuspending particles uh -huh. which came from other, from other parts. But again, this is something that is difficult to control and uh, the plants are frequently not very uh, knowledgeable about the exhaust systems that they have. They just have mm. a system in place. They checked it whenever it was installed 10 years ago and they have never checked it again. Mm. That is frequently my experience. Mm -hmm. Or they have not, they have ma maintained it once and they don't know if the flow has gone up or down. Or So it could be that the, frequently we find that the, um, the flows are not properly calibrated or, or, or made targeted for the specific process because then the process can change and then the, it, was, uh, it was planned or programmed for a certain process and then the exhaust is not changed, but the process is changed. So then it's not adequate anymore. Yeah. So this is something that we find also that, it, that is challenging to, to actually improve in the workplaces. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think specifically for this uh, aerotaxi reactor, it's also that if I have understood the cleaning procedure correctly, it's like you're opening it up uh, at the top and that's the only opening. So if you, if you would be able to put some kind of local exhaust there, uh, I think that that could help with the, with the possible exposure. Uh, mm -hmm. But it depends maybe on what type of equipment you have, and if you are if you have to open it up in several different places, then you might if you're exhausting in one place, maybe you're resuspending in uh, in another. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, I think maybe that has to be uh, individually um, thought out to what, what kind of uh, uh, engineering controls that could help. Yeah, tailored to every location. Okay, um, let me see in paper four. Ah, in, I was surprised in paper four at your black carbon concentrations. I thought they were pretty high, uh, considering the kind of, of process that you were monitoring and the kind of environment that you were measuring. Because you talk, you, you wrote in figure three, for example, around 1.3, I think it was, to two micrograms per cubic meter. And this is what we find what we find in, in Ambiente in Barcelona, close to a, close to a, one of the main avenues, for example. So these are, I was, I was surprised to find these concentrations from graphene. Um, is this something that you were expecting? Because I saw then that the titanium dioxide was also not too low. Yes, exactly this graph. So you can see we are, you have an average of around two mm. with the micro -F. So, uh, yeah, I was surprised at these concentrations. Uh, was this anything uh, that you were expecting or not? Or was the company, what was their reaction when they saw this kind of concentrations? Yeah, now I'm not sure if you, because uh, now you said average around two. So now I just need to clarify that uh, these are two different y-axis. So the black carbon is on the, um, the right uh, axis and uh, it's the, the average value is... Uh, like uh, around 0 0.2 or something. But then the peaks are at 2 micrograms, if this okay. is what you meant. Yeah, because the other ones is the APS measurements, which is for the y, uh, the left y-axis. Yes, yeah, so so the average value of the uh, BC concentrations, it not, it's not 2, It's but the peaks are at up to 2. But this might okay. be a little bit unclear in the graph. Uh, no, no, then, then it was probably that I misread it. I thought I had read somewhere in a table that it was 1.3. In the yes. Breathing yeah. Zone. Well, that is true. That is true. Actually, yes. What? Yeah. That we measured with, um, uh, with. Um, uh, now I lost the word. With the OCEC analysis. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and then it was uh, one point three. Yes, that's true. Uh, and that was the average over uh, several hours, I think. Um, yeah, but I, I think it was. Since the process that they were doing was the handling of the powder during these peaks. And I think that, because uh, I think that this is the, no, it's the personal breathing. So, yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I did expect it, but since they were handling it and uh, it was, I also, if I remember correctly, they were handling it in a fume hood, but the fume hood was completely open. So it didn't really like help with the, <laughs> I, I don't exactly know what, why they were doing it like that, but uh, it, it, so it didn't really help with reducing uh, the emissions to the worker. So I think, but what we are seeing here is, the, is also in the emission zone. So this is really close to mm -hmm. the actual uh, handling process. Uh, so when they are handling this powder, it's, it's very dusty. So I, I, 
I think that these peaks of about two micro, micrograms is also what we have seen in, in a few other uh, studies. So, yeah. yeah, okay. Then 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 I misinterpreted. I thought it was more the average, but uh, it makes sense that if it's a peak value, then it, it's more reasonable. But then this leads me to the next question that I had with, with the OCC analysis. Because for the OCC, as you know, we need to have a very homogeneous sample because mm -hmm. this, uh, the, the, the instrument is looking at the change in blackness of the filter with a laser. So we need to assume that the point that is that's, that's being covered by the laser is, is similar or is homogeneous when compared to the, other, the remainder of the filter. And if we have very low concentrations, then it could be, I mean, if we're looking in this case as graphene, if you have low emissions or then uh, I would expect that the filter would be maybe not homogeneous or that you would have not sufficient mass to, for it to be to, detected by the OCC. But uh, since, you are, you, since you use this technique uh, that we usually use more for, for ambient air than for occupational, uh, I assume that you did have homogeneous samples and you did not have problems with, uh, with, low, with the, the, the concentrations being below the limit of detection of the instrument. Well, as you can see in uh, in some of the uh, tables that we we did have as quite some of the samples below the limit of detection, um, and but we do uh, we have done these samplings with uh, this open um, open face sampling, um, mm -hmm. so uh, which is why where we uh, like we, we I think that we try to convince ourselves that we do it uh, homogeneously over the whole uh, filter area. But with the low concentrations, this is, of course, uh, a risk. But when we do um, the OCC analysis, we also um, uh, take a part which is not like in the middle or not at the edge. So we take uh, one stamp uh, from from the, yeah, the middle part of the, or, well, not in the middle, but uh, on the surrounding part. I can't really describe this in a good way. No, um, no, I, but, I, but, but, yeah. but so, yeah, the, the, it is difficult, especially when we do this um, uh, with the low sampling uh, times. Uh, but these uh, have also been corrected for the blank uh, filters that we had, because we usually do this filter, uh, no, sorry, um, field blanks. Um, so mm -hmm. we analyze those as well, and then... Uh, um, uh, take away this um, uh, blank. Uh, yeah, we blank correct them uh, towards these uh, field blanks that we that we have. Um, but what? Yeah, the problem is especially when we do these kind of short work task um, measurements, which can sometimes it's like fifteen minutes or thirty minutes, and then the the concentrations are well below limit of detection. So, but that's why we also try to. Uh, uh, measure, especially for the personal breeding zone, to mimic um, more and more the uh, a whole um, uh, work um, uh, part of the day, like uh, to yeah, to strive for a six or eight eight, eight hour average. Uh, they are sampling um, uh, the personal breeding uh, zone samples for several work tasks. Uh, to try and uh, get a higher concentration that we can calculate with uh, later on. But even though it's, they were only, uh, for this specific case, they were only handling this material during half of the day, maybe. So we couldn't still uh, get um, get a lot of uh, concentration. But yeah, this, this is a, a problem, I think, with the filter-based sampling, especially when you're trying to uh, characterize uh, short, specific work tasks. Yeah, yeah, indeed, yeah. definitely. Okay, well, we have one other question about this paper. If you could show us figure eight, please. This is probably that I, again, I, maybe I, I didn't really understand it, but um, yeah, there. And uh, I see the, the, the gray boxes are when you're when the weighing or handling the powders in liquid and in, in powder form. But what surprises me is the trend in B, in figure B. So this decreasing baseline of the um, APS measurements, right? In the background, so, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a, any explanation for this? Because it, it doesn't show in the in the top chart in the A uh, in the A figure. And uh, yeah, you, you talked about the issue of the way that the powders were handled, but this would not account for the background, no. the, the decrease of the baseline. Do you have any interpretation for this? Uh, this is actually something that we have been discussing uh, with this decreasing uh, background. Uh, yeah, it looks a little bit weird. But what we 
But what we think, if you compare it to the, the top one, you see that the baseline is just slightly above, uh, slightly above one. Um, and uh, for the in, in graph B, you see that it starts uh, at, at a higher level, almost at, at 10. So we think that, because this was two separate days, uh, so uh, figure A is day one and figure two uh, B is uh, day two. And we think that the general concentration in the room, uh, the, the leaning background concentration going down is the ventilation, the general ventilation in the room um, uh, controlling, uh, like ventilating out some particle emission that have happened earlier that day. Uh, so because it, it lands almost, well, the work task ends also, but it's on its way down to the same level at, as we had on the day before. So I think that this decrease in trend is just um, a reason or a, an effect of the general ventilation in the room uh, effect, like trying to ventilate out the, some particles that have been emitted uh, earlier. And I, I see. Yeah, and I don't remember exactly when this happened, but this is from the same workplace as this... Um, um, you know, from my presentation, I show this uh, supply air uh, particle increase. Mm -hmm. And this is from the same work task and the same room. And I don't remember if this is the same day, but this could possibly be one reason that if, if you have a particle infiltration, a lot of particle infiltration, and then the general ventilation is trying to um, ventilate that out again. <laughs> yeah, it could, so. could be. Would have been nice to, to have been able to see with the dust track too, to see if, if you had the same trend. But of course, the, the concentration is so low that it is not detectable. No, but, um, yeah. But it would, it would just to see if it's an instrumental issue because there's two APSs or an environmental issue and the, the, the actual exhaust from the plant or whatever. But yeah, then. what we could maybe do is compare maybe with the CPC measurements actually. Mm -hmm. See if you see the same decrease in trend in that. Uh, I, yeah. I can't say that I remember what they, they look like. So, But that, that could be something that we could do. Yeah. Okay. Um, now we have just one paper. Let me see what else I wrote. Ah, I was curious, uh, well, since I, I was not familiar with the NACI system, but you said that you enhanced the uh, deposition with, um, with electrostatic deposition, so uh, the deposition efficiency with an electrostatic system. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering about uh, also what happens uh, if you have hydrophobic particles to introduce in the, in the, in the liquid, because we have had and also thinking of a recent experience of uh, in, in our work that we used a kind of similar system but uh, but much larger and, and not not so user friendly as yours and um, we were we were looking at uh, hydrophobic particles so the thing we, we had the problem of introducing those into suspension and uh, it was it was solved by using uh, condensate uh, condensation and supersaturation so but of course th this is what made our instrument so much bulkier so I guess in your case, if you have hydrophobic particles, I don't see how they could be introduced into the system, right? Or, um, Well, if you have a, a particle that is... Because what we did was... Oh, maybe this is not explained enough. But uh, what we did was that we had the, the zinc oxide nanoparticles in this suspension and then we nebulized it and then dried it uh, through a, through a, 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 a silica yield dryer. So that mm -hmm. we, when we exposed the cells, it was only the zinc oxide nanoparticles uh, which we had uh, in the suspension. So I think that uh, it should be possible, like, since we're you're you're not concerned with the with the water, like you do, you're not dissolving the par particles in the water. You're just using it to nebulize it. Mm -hmm. So if you have the particles as they are, uh, you should be able to generate them uh, anyway, and then. Uh, Maybe not. Okay. Yeah, you I can, see. So even even if on the surface of the of the suspension, if kind of a supernatant, you will still be able to aerosolize them and uh, and feed them into the system. Oh well, well maybe uh, I would think so, but maybe not. Uh, now I'm a bit unsure actually. Um, but if well, you if you're able to dispense them in the water, but not dissolve, like it's not. Uh, yeah, okay, if you, it's uh, just a coating on the surface, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't tried it, so now, I, now I'm quite unsure actually how that would work. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but I think you should be able to use hydrophobic particles also. I, I think that someone else did it, so... Uh, but now, yeah, I'm, I'm, 
I'm quite unsure about this. No, it would be would be worth a try because mm. definitely in some some of the cases we have uh, particles and and that that we can control the concentrate the um, sorry their properties. And uh, if we come across these cases, then you need to find a way to still carry out the toxicity assessments. Yeah. Um, re just the last question about this one that you saw there's no cytotoxic response, right? Mm -hmm. So this was not not even like in the case of the of the metabolic activity, which was uh, mostly found in the mid uh, for the medium dose. In the case of cytotoxicity, you don't you did not see any response at all, size uh, dose dependent or not. Uh, no, we had um, uh, the cytotoxicity assay that we were uh, using. Um, why the results were quite difficult to interpret, which is uh, a little bit why we haven't included it in the paper. But the, what it showed was kind of that they were so similar to the control. And the positive control that we had was not like positive enough, uh, or so. So the 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 data was very noisy, uh, but we didn't see any clear um, cytotoxicity for any case for any of the systems. Um, so yeah, that that was pretty much <laughs> mm -hmm. what I can say about that. So and I I don't know if it's due to that we or. or it is probably due to that the concentrations were very low. So the the what we how we measured the cytotoxicity was with this LDH um, assay, and then you are dependent on that the cells uh, break up to release this LDH. And if the uh, if the concentration isn't high enough to induce uh, that uh, severe response, then you wouldn't get any LDH concentration or or very very low. So and with the with a very noisy data and uh, a weak positive control, this was we, we couldn't see any clear cytotoxicity. Mm. But in any case, I think that the the, the value of, of this work was to test the native system, and that you did very nicely, and you get very very robust results. So I think that's um, that's uh, you were not trying to look at the toxicity of the zinc oxide particles. But it was more about the system. So that is that already achieved its objective. Okay, well, I have only some, some final comments or questions, but I think we're almost done. Um, I really like that your work is very applicable. That it was from the beginning, you mentioned that you wanted to be applied and to have a, an impact on, on improving workplace, uh, reducing workplace exposures. So I was wondering if you found more, even more applicability, like you say, with, regarding the cleaning, the cleaning work could be applied to hospitals or to school environments uh, to, to give them some guidelines. For, I'm thinking, for example, of the new particle formation. So uh, we, we had some cases where we saw in Australia, for example, in schools, they used to clean right before the kids go into class. So that means that then the ozone from the street would come in and then the kids would come in with the highest new particle formation bursts. Oh. Whereas in Barcelona we clean in, uh, in the right after the kids have left, so then there were fewer exposures. So if mm. you could, I'm wondering. Well, I guess you could extrapolate your results and um, and try to uh, transfer them to other other sectors, like I said, hospitals or or schools, because I saw that you have a good collaboration with STAMI, right? Which is the Norwegian, no, the National Institute for Occupational Health. Yeah, we, right. we haven't collaborated with them. It's just that uh, they were uh, they were adapting the method that we developed. So we haven't uh, had a collaboration with them. Oh, I see. Because that's what I, I did not, it was not very clear to me whether they were, but yeah, definitely you can see already an impact there that your method could be or can be extrapolated. So yeah. I would uh, encourage you to to follow this and try to make as much publicity of your, of your nice work. Because I think it can be, it has lots of applications, not only in the specific research that we carry out, but also in other sectors as at large scale, like uh, like I mentioned. Even at uh, at the home, at the at, uh, for this residential use, I was wondering because you for your work you you tested or you you with questionnaires, you checked which sprays or which cleaning products were mostly used at professional level. Of course, you cannot do that at what population wide level, but do you think that the kind of commercial sprays that you tested are also widely used for residential purposes? Yes, yeah, it was. The the commercial brand that we uh, tested was a very uh, widely used brand among uh, consumers as well. And actually one important, I can comment on two things, that uh, the impact for the the occupation as a whole, I have been, at least in Sweden, it, this project have 
had quite an impact on the on the on the occupational group or so to say on the branch because uh, it's um, I have been out to speak for some of the uh, the parties in in different parts of Sweden to to um, um, yeah convey the results that we have and that it has been a great interest. Uh, from uh, unions and so on, uh, at least in Sweden so far, uh, about uh, these results and the applicability of it, and for, from both the, the individual workers, but also on on a higher level for like education for uh, new uh, new employees within the cleaning occupation, and also for management and so on. Uh, so I think that it, it is uh, applicable work, and it, it has uh, uh, in, increased the interest of the project, uh, at least in, in Sweden so far. And uh, regarding the homes, uh, actually, uh, we have also talked a lot with, with them, with some uh, uh, cleaning workers during different uh, settings, and especially during the human chamber exposure study, we have had the opportunity to discuss with them about how they do their work and and uh, things that they experience. And what they have said, because we we have tried to be focused on. Uh, cleaning in um, like more like workplaces and and uh, schools and so on, uh, but not tried. We did we tried to not include too much uh, home uh, cleaning. But what we have found out is that uh, a lot of uh, people that um, like hire uh, cleaning workers to come ho come home and clean in their residential um, res residence. Um, they they have to use the cleaning workers have to use the cleaning products that the occupants themselves have bought. Uh, so I think that the results from this study is, and then then the cleaning worker, even though they have maybe an education and knows what types of products not to use and uh, or how to use them, they don't have a choice when they come home to someone who have already bought a lot of sprays uh, or something. Um, so I think that one thing that they wanted was also that this research um, uh, can reach the general public in a more uh, wide range so that also the regular consumer that are um, uh, hiring uh, people to clean, that either that the cleaning workers can bring their own uh, um, products uh, or that they think about what kind of products that they do have at home. Mm -hmm. But then as as you as an individual uh, uh, Residence or occupant, uh, if you if you're not hiring uh, professional cleaning workers, but you're cleaning yourself, uh, of course you can still think about uh, using cleaning sprays and when you do it and when when not to do it. Uh, but then you can also remember that you will not be as exposed as a professional um, cleaning a worker who will clean for uh, several uh, hours every day during their whole work life. Uh, so when you clean like maybe once a week or once a month or something, you're you're not getting as exposed as those. Mm -hmm. So the occupational exposure is still the the largest um, the largest exposure, but you can still as an individual also think about this. So. Sure. Yeah, definitely. I do think that the, that there's a lot of uh, of room for a lot of potential for for application design and communication of your work. So this is this is great. Uh, to finalize, just uh, I really, uh, I really uh, enjoyed your, your, or really agree with your conclusion about the, the multiparametric approach because this is a complex, a complex uh, problem that you are targeting. This uh, business of the occupational exposures, and we need to be able to to know all the tools that we that are available. That's also what I was asking you about your study design, and and to be able to decide which is the best tool or the best parameter that we want to that we need to monitor to detect or to characterize a certain exposure and i think it showed that you are that you are well um, knowledgeable about all the all, all the the type of parameters of that are interesting for particle characterization the type of monitors that are available it shows that you have worked with them firsthand so this is uh, this is also very very good to see that 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 you are aware of the need to use many parameters and that you know how to use them so this also gives a lot of value and um, yeah, and also the last thing is that I found that um, the integration of the work that you have done was very good because uh, I think it was a challenge to find two such different types of worker communities, two such different types of particles and even concepts like ultrafines and nanoparticles again. And you have managed to, to make a good integration of the results in your discussion in each of the papers first and then among each of the papers in the thesis. 
So um, I just wanted to congratulate you for that as well, because it's not it's not easy to to try to talk about cleaning and at the same time aero taxi in the same book. And you have made it possible, and it is, uh, like I said, readable and, and and friendly for the for for the reader. So this is something that you should definitely take home. That it is a good job, well done. Oh, thank you. And uh, yeah, so I think that's it from my side. I'd like to congratulate you and your supervisors on the work. And um, I think I am I am done. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we proceed uh, with. Questions from the examination committee. And uh, since you're sitting in three different places, let's begin with Professor Lena Palme at Karolinska Institutet. Okay. Karolinska Institutet. How do you say it in English? Anyway, Lena. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> do you. Have anything to add? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to thank for your nice presentation, both of you, and the nice discussion follow. And I also want to congratulate you, Karin, for your extremely uh, nice thesis where you cover so many aspects and, and you go from, from workers to chamber exposure to cell culture. Uh, so this translational approach is very attempting and nice, I would say. Um, I think I was picked in, in the board, especially for the fifth paper. Uh, so I will start to focus on that and perhaps come back to some other questions if, if uh, time is there. Uh, so I want to start with asking uh, your choice of A549. Are those good cells representative for how it is in vivo, you think? Well, yeah, this is, is of course, uh, always a, a choice. Well, uh, because they these cells are very robust and uh, it's these immortalized um, uh, can, uh, cells which are, yeah, so they are very robust and, and maybe not as sensitive. But we did choose these cells for, I, I would say, two reasons. First of all, a lot of the studies are done on these uh, A549s cells, uh, so it's, it's easier to compare to other studies, the results from our study. Uh, and also, one aspect of this study was also that we were in the process of... Um, starting up this uh, kind of cell exposures in our lab and uh, wanted to um, start out with something that was a little bit more robust uh, when we were uh, developing the, the process of conducting these cell exposures in our lab. Um, so I think that that was the choice for using uh, A549 as a start uh, cell now. But I think it would be interesting to also try to use more um, uh, maybe primary cells or or so on to uh, to study maybe a little bit even more sensitivity uh, sensitivity of the cells. So yeah, yeah. there there are other cell lines that are more normal than A five four nine, but also when when you go to this air liquid interface culturing, you only have them for twenty four hours. Is that enough to get the the tight junction? Uh, do the cells express surfactant and start to produce that, or have you tested sort of any signs of, of um, this tight junction and, and things that's important to mimic the alveolar? Uh, no, we didn't test uh, anything. Uh, uh, let me think just a second. Um, no, we didn't test anything specifically for uh, what had, if they had developed any tight junctions or, or so on. Uh, but I think in collaborations with our, our partners and, and also some literature reviewing, the 24 hours should have been enough at least to establish uh, a, a good enough uh, approach. But I think maybe, because I think that there was a study that showed this uh, when they A549 started to um, express all of these things uh, at the air liquid interface. And I think that that was within 24 hours, but now I'm a little bit unsure. But we didn't test anything, so I can't really uh, absolutely sure say that uh, uh, they were completely done. But one um, aspect that might have been a limitation and a problem with this study was also that we were, we were doing because in the native system, you have to use these um, the insert uh, with the surface area uh, of uh, 0 0.33 uh, square centimeters. So it's the equivalent of a 96 well plate well uh, 
area, um, approximately. So they are. It's quite a small uh, surface area of the uh, of the insert. And if we're growing, we were afraid a little bit in the beginning that if we were growing the cells too long, that we would re retrieve an, an overgrowth uh, of in these inserts since they were so small. Because we were seeding them uh, one day, and then we were. Uh, for, and then we then they were seeded for 24 hours, and then we were uh, flipping them to uh, ALI state, and then we're growing for 24 hours in ALI state, and then we were exposing them, and then we were incubating them for an additional 24 hours. So we already had them for several days, uh, and we were a bit afraid of uh, how if they, especially our control cells that wouldn't be exposed to anything, that they were start that they would start to overgrow in the insert and then maybe uh, affecting the results at the end. But this, as I said, wasn't something that we specifically tested here. Uh, but this could be an issue, yeah. So for the submerged and iso-submerged system, do you culture them in the same size of, of plates? Yes, yes. Okay. So we did, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and, and then just a quick regarding, you write somewhere that you perform the, the experiments in three separate experiments, i.e. three technical replicates. For me, that's contradiction. So how many different experiments did you actually do with different vials, sort of, starting from all over with the A549? Aha. Uh -huh. Wait, now I don't know if I understand the question. Well, the exposures we did at three different times. So we had what we are calling three technical replicates. Maybe this is not correct. But so we did the same same dose, uh, same same exposure conditions uh, at three different times to get the, the free. But then at each time point, we had several wells with the same dose. But, but the cells originally came from the same vial, so you culture them at the same time, sort of starting to do the culturing at the same time. Ah, now I get what you mean. No, so the passage number is not the same, if that's what you mean. We have, okay. no, we, yeah, no. So we started with this, with one vial and then we seeded them and then so the first experiment, no, I, I don't think I have included it here, but I think we have it, uh, the information somewhere that, um, uh, we, we have some passage number for one experiment and then another for the next one and then another for the next one. But since we, we the control cells that we are always, uh, all the data is uh, presented as uh, percent of control and the control cells and the exposed cells are all the time uh, seeded from the same passage number. That's very good. Yeah. So, so going to that, uh, both in figure three and four, you normalize to the control situation. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you then are missing is if the basal level differs between the three different kind of um, exposure or, or models, subgrowth, sub ESO, and, and uh, nascent, um, are, are the basal production of what you ILAID, for instance, um, do they differ from the three different culture methods? You can't see this when you normalize, right? Now I don't. I'm not sure what you mean by the basal production. Uh, you, the control uh, production, the thing that you ah. have normalized to. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Is is that different between the three different uh, models? Ah, between the three different models. Um, oh, this was a good question. Uh, ooh. We did like from the from the beginning where we have looked at all the data. We have of course we have looked at it as the separate uh, without uh, normalizing anything. But now I don't remember. Um, it it might differ a bit uh, between the different ones. But I sorry I sorry I don't remember actually if it does. So I can't really answer this. But this is kind of one reason why we do the normalization so that we control it for for the same. Uh, for the same conditions. Yeah, yeah, but at the same time, you hide something. I mean, for instance, is the yeah. cell number different in the different wells? I mean, if you culture nope. them submerged, then, then they can continue growing. In my experience when cultured uh, a liquid interface, then the, the growth is stopped. Oh, yeah, okay. So, uh, well, so okay, there could I get be... What, I yeah, I get what you mean. Uh, we we did uh, culture, of course, in the same way. So we we should have the same uh, number of cells in the the all the wells. And we actually did try at the end to uh, to uh, trypsinize the inserts after the exposure to try and count this 
um, uh, the cell number, uh, which was something that I learned uh, very late in this project that you could do this. Uh, but we had a lot of problems with this. This was very difficult. We tried to optimize this uh, trypsinization and incubation times. But uh, yeah, we, we, weren't, we didn't manage to count the cells actually. So this is something that of course for the future should be um, developed even further so that we also can control for how many cells we actually do have. Uh, but we, we weren't, sorry, we weren't able to do it uh, during this study. And, and then my last question regarding this paper then is that you summarized that culture at air liquid interface, that it's a more sensitive um, method. Um, and, and I agree that it's really also mimicking the, the in vivo situation. But could the results also, I mean, when you compare the different methods like culture submerged with the dose, how much is really reaching the, the cells and, and other things that might influence the dose uh, between mm -hmm. the different models, sort of. Mm. Uh, yeah, about the dose, we uh, that's that's a, a, lim a limitation and an issue with because um, for the aerosol measurements within the NASIF, we have been able to quite uh, detailed calculate these uh, with since we are doing the aerosol measurements at the same time. Uh, but for the submerged systems, we have so far we haven't done any measurements of the dose. We are maybe we are thinking about. Um, we have been discussing if we should do some kind of uh, measurements. So, because we have frozen all the cells, so we can uh, do some additional um, measurements, uh, hopefully. Um, but we haven't done any uh, measured dose of that. Uh, and then for the calculation of the doses, we have assumed 100% uh, deposition after 24 hours. But of course, you can have these uh, uh, wall losses, and maybe not all of the particles are. Uh, deposited, deposits uh, within the 24 hours. So the, the dose for the submerged systems are a bit unsure, but at the same time, um, uh, the dose levels are actually a little bit higher, like the calculated doses are a little bit higher in the uh, submerged systems than in the nasive system, if I uh, remember correctly, uh, due to that in the nasive system, it, the, it was a difficulty aerosolizing the, the particles so um, so uh, so we, we couldn't really uh, generate the specific dose that we uh, wanted to to compare with the submerged systems so yeah the, the doses for the submerged systems are a bit uh, unsure yeah yeah and also the presence of serum in the cell culture medium with the possibility of corona yes uh, of course yeah, so then the dose can vary even more, sort of. Yeah. I think I stopped there. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to read all your paper um, and um, listening to your defense also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lena. Then we proceed with Christoph Asbach. Are you with us? Okay, yes. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Well, first of all, let me join Ma and Lena in congratulating you. It was really a pleasure to read your thesis and uh, to follow your presentation, which was very clear and very much to the point. And I also like that you never left aside the focus on the application of your research, which is very good. Um, nevertheless, I put together a bunch of questions, as you can see here. But actually, I had to put a check mark already after most of them uh, while you were discussing with Ma, because she asked, most, most of the questions were pretty much exactly the same. Um, so I only have two questions left on my, on my list. The first one is actually on the study of uh, the new particle formation where you add ozone. Um, and I mean, it's pretty clear from the size distributions that it, it must be nucleation generated particles. The only thing that struck me is that I would have expected much higher concentrations um, because, I mean, looking at the, I think it's figure four in, in paper one. one yeah. um, the concentrations are in the, say, 10 thousands per cubic centimeter. And normally from nucleation, I would expect something in the, in the range of millions part of particles per cubic centimeter. Do you have any explanation why your concentration is much lower than that? Um, no, maybe not really. The, well, the limitation with this study was that we were not able to measure the VOC concentration at the same time. So I can't really be sure about 
uh, VOC concentration generated during these uh, measurements. These have, this, this is just an evidence that the, there was a, a VOC a concentration that could um, uh, um, react with the ozone. Uh, but since I don't know exact the exact levels of the, the ozone levels, I, I or the, the VOC levels, uh, I can't really uh, know this um, know specifically how, how the reaction was. So I, I can't really explain why it's lower. But also this was uh, in a, in a inside this um, exposure chamber that we did this um, experiment. So um, yeah, I, no, I, I, the nucleation mode, it, um, it's not uh, my strongest expertise area. So I, I can't really explain it. Uh, yeah, but okay, maybe we can, can just speculate about this. I mean, it, it, the reasons could be, for example, dilution. I mean, what, what was the air exchange rate that you had? Uh, I think it was 0 0.7, uh, but I can look it up. So it's 0.7 per hour. Yeah, I think okay, that, so yes. That's, that's not very high, right? So that no. so dilution is probably not the case, but um, I mean, the... But I, I, I think was, that one one reason could be that a lot of the products, uh, you, you mix in a lot of water, uh, like so, especially, uh, oh, I can't really see on the screen, I just need to have it here. Um, I think that it's the, um, uh, the A and C uh, graphs. Oh, well, they are very different. <laughs> but they are the ones where you are mixing uh, a high concentration uh, liquid with the water uh, for, for this uh, product. So maybe uh, the VOC concentrations aren't uh, too high uh, or like that, that what you're generating is, is not high enough for the uh, formation to occur. I don't know. This could. Okay. I, I think that this is like the the, pos the possibility of generating the uh, the VOCs is the condition for these particles to be formed. So, uh. Uh -huh. well, uh, I mean, you you use the DMS for that, right? Yeah. That's that's this combustion instrument. Yeah. Okay, um, and it well officially it starts to measure at five nanometers, right? Yeah. Do you have any insight about the counting efficiency for small particles? Because looking at figure five, mm. it could be that you simply miss most of them because they're smaller than what you're actually measuring. Right? Because you see that actually the uh -huh. concentration increases over time, which could, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just speculation, but it could be that actually the uh, most of the particles are just smaller than what you're measuring. Then they, they grow into the size range of mm -hmm. your instrument. Yeah. Yeah, that that could actually be uh, one possibility. Because yeah, because what, what we are also seeing is this uh, particle growth uh, as time passes. Um, mm. So yeah, that could possibly be an because I now I haven't read up specifically on DMS actually, so I don't know the counting efficiency at the low uh, oh. low particle range. But I, I would assume that it's it is a bit lower. Yes. But you didn't measure with the CPC here, did you? Because if you have a CPC no. with a much lower um, D50, then you would probably see much higher concentration with a CPC than with the DMS. And that could be an indication that the particles are really smaller. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, we didn't have a CPC here, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and then I only have one small question left. And you showed in your presentation during the workplace measurements that you measured in the supply air. Um, and you saw that increase of the concentration in the supply air and in your workplace, and you concluded that it's actually particles which are brought in from outside. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, did you check the, the supply air system? Does it really take in fresh air from outside? Because I've sometimes seen that for, you know, to, to save energy, they're recirculating the air. And some of them use pretty poor filters. In that case, you're not only recirculating the air, but all the particles in the air as well. Um, did you check on that? Uh, no, we didn't check on that. But actually, uh, when this occurred, we we who were standing in the room, we actually also uh, smelled a very strong uh, burnt smell. So we think that uh, I think that there was a burning event outside in the in the city that we were. 
so I, I, we're pretty sure that that was the, the particles that they were ventilating in. Uh, but okay. I, we didn't check the ventilation system uh, specifically, so I can't really answer this. But mm. yeah, yeah, I mean, that's just, aspect. It's, it's a surprise that we had every now and then. So yeah. it was worth checking. Mm. Okay, well, these were the two questions that were left on my, my long list. Um, so thank you again and congratulations again. And yeah, yeah I'm, thank you. I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph. And then we'll proceed with Don Norbeck from Uppsala University. Yes. Can you hear, hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's very nice work. And uh, you have sort of investigated two, two sort of um, areas of. of uh, particle exposure that's not been much exposed, much investigated before. I will just uh, give some uh, comments and some not really questions, but I mean, about the cleaning sprays. I mean, cleaning sprays are used in Western countries because they have been marketed by the producers. It's not used everywhere in the world. And maybe it's not needed to be used, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but I mean, the old method is to basically apply the, the liquid, feeding liquid on some kind of tissue and mechanically rub or brush or whatever. It would have been nice to have that kind of, of uh, condition in your system because then you would have the VUCs but not the fine particles mm. because now it's really, we don't know which is causing the problem. No, exactly. Uh, the concern, health concern about cleaning sprays uh, has been mainly about the asthma among cleaners. And that has been observed in epi studies, both in occupational cleaners and home cleaning. So it seems home cleaning is not, exposure is enough to create asthma problems. Uh, but actually you didn't um, find something about asthma, more rhinitis. And rhinitis maybe not so much this demonstrate, but a tricky issue here from a sort of, protecting the, the worker or the home cleaner is, is the foam method enough? The reduction of exposure with the foam method, if it can be used, is that really enough to save people from, from the health effects? What do you think? <laughs> well, or, uh, or shall they stop using the, the sprays and go back to, to sort of the old fashioned uh, method with liquid on tissue? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, if it's enough, well, um, I don't know. Well, when we when we chose the methods to include in this human chamber exposure study, we had from the beginning, uh, uh, we were thinking about this when you're uh, dipping your um, uh, your cloth into the cleaning solution and then uh, wiping down the surfaces. Uh, but one problem with that is more the dermal exposure because uh, the, the cleaning workers are exposed to the clean, cleaning chemicals in another way. And so they use gloves, you know that. Well, we actually, during, well, some, in the questionnaire study, we found that a lot of people, a lot of the workers used gloves. And in our human chamber exposure study, we um, we offered them to use gloves if, gloves if they wanted to. And uh, some of them did uh, do that. Um, but but did, we didn't look specifically into the dermal exposure, so I can't really estimate that. Um, but we, yeah, it, when you do these types of studies, it's always some kind of limitation. So uh, regarding if, like, if we could have had a fourth method, I would have wanted one where we had the chemicals in the cloth um, and uh, as, a, as a one additional step so that you didn't have any type of particle generation, uh, but we still could have the cleaning chemicals. But what is actually today is these microfiber cloths today are really good. And when you're water pre-moistening them, uh, which is typically used uh, among quite a lot of cleaning workers today uh, with the companies that we have been in contact with, uh, they are uh, able to clean off the surfaces quite well with just these uh, water pre moisture microfiber cloths. So I think that this is a really good um, alternative and, and option. But then, of course, sometimes you are um, in need of uh, a chemical, a cleaning chemical to, to really clean the surfaces. And then I think from, from my research, the, the, the best option if, is, of course, foam. But since we haven't looked at... Uh, uh, an additional lower exposure option. I can't really say if it's good enough, but 
from their preliminary results, it, it seems to at least help the exposure situation, I have to say. Yeah, it, it reduced maybe to one third, but I, um, I mean, from sort of exposure point of view, maybe that's not enough. Mm. Because if you sort of compare the, the professional cleaner and the home cleaner, you know that they have much less exposure and still you see something. Mm. Mm. That's just my, my guess, but okay. Uh, that's, that's all from me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And uh, continue with the deputy members of the examination committee. Martin. Uh, can pass the microphone if you want. Or uh, Christina. Yes. Uh, I first want to join the choir uh, praising your thesis and uh, uh, your defense. And I also want to thank the opponent for this very nice discussion that you had. It was uh, very clear everything and interesting from, from the beginning to the end. Um, I, was, I also had a bunch of questions and most of them have been answered. Uh, one thing I was wondering a bit about, perhaps you could say a few words about how you communicated the results to the participants that you did in this uh, exposure study. Was it uh, written or was it orally? What were the reactions from the participants? Did you learn some lessons on how to communicate results? And uh, do you also know if after this test, did they actually do some changes at their companies and in their cleaning uh, procedures? Yeah. Um, first of all, I can say, when we, during the human exposure study, we had uh, the participants were actually, we had, I, I remember one participant that actually came and said that, oh, now I've started to think about this and this uh, during their work. Uh, so I think that they, they learned things when they joined the study and some of them actually did change some of their, the work uh, processes that they, uh, or how they were do, conducting their work. Um, but then actually um, relaying the results to the participants haven't been done fully uh, since we haven't published the study yet. Uh, we're now in the final stages of, of doing so, but it, it hasn't actually been um, communicating fully to the, all the participants yet. Uh, but we are planning to. Uh, but then I do have had some uh, communications with them um, when I have been speaking at some of these um, branch uh, mesur uh, for for uh, general workers and so on and and I think the interest is is great in this study and and I I have learned a lot about how to communicate uh, like research to people that doesn't uh, work with research um, and uh, and also got an input on uh, on how they actually do things and and uh, what what kind of things that we can think about in our studies and in this uh, research we or during the the process of this research we have also had contact with this reference group and in that we have had both union members and and branch organization uh, members and then some uh, people representing their cleaning workers and so on so we have gotten uh, continuous input and um, been able to discuss the design and and uh, also the communication, uh, how to communicate uh, uh, the results with them. Um, yeah, so it 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 has been a, an interesting process, as, uh, and uh, I think that the the response from them at least have been, um, and from the, uh, the the talks that I've been giving have been positive, and and especially I think that the the the, the strongest thing is that they are glad that the occupation is uh, being researched, actually, that, 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 they, that we are acknowledging them, I think. Thank you very much. And I also think that this reference group is a very good idea, both for getting input into your research, but also for dissemination of, of mm. the results. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the audience here in the room, any questions? Well, it, you, you get the microphone. Yeah. yeah, thanks for the nice um, show. Um, I was, I have just a question on, like, in occupational exposures, you see quite many, like, short peaks. 
of high exposure and then low background concentrations. Do you have any like guess or if you know from others who have studied this either in like toxicity studies or the health effects like from short peaks compared to low background con or I mean the total mass could perhaps be the same from a low dose during a long time compared to sh short high peaks. Do you have a, any idea of this? Uh, no, I can't really say that I, I, I know it and we haven't really studied, but we, what, this is what we see a lot, especially in the, in the nanotechnology industry, that we have these uh, uh, short, quite high peaks uh, at some times, but uh, at some points. And within the cleaning occupation, you can, um, you can see it a little bit uh, in the way that when you're doing the cleaning work, for example, in a hotel room, uh, bathroom, then you get a, a maybe a little bit longer, but a short peak uh, during that bathroom uh, cleaning process. And then um, uh, they are doing other things for maybe 10 more minutes and then they are switching rooms and then they get a peak again. So then you still have these um, uh, peaks that occur at different time points. Um, but I, I think that short high peaks can can be um, as uh, that you have to take them seriously um, even uh, compared to uh, an average low lower dose but this is not something that I have been able to study yet so I I can't really answer it uh, better than that but um, I think it's it, it's interesting and I think it's important to look at even though uh, you get uh, short higher peaks, especially with like maybe the fibrous non nanoparticles that if you have a very high, even though it's short, uh, I think that that can uh, especially be something, uh, uh, an exposure of concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other questions? Then... Uh, Let's see if uh, if anybody wrote. It's it's uh, one more second to write, and then so right now or be forever silent. Um, I have one email huh? question. It's Hokan Tenebay in uh, Göteborg. Mm -hmm. um, he says that he's very impressive of everything and of your defense. And ask if you can, you can send him a, a thesis. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course I can. <laughs> okay, good. Short and simple answer to that. So with, with that one, and on the behalf of the Faculty of Engineering here at Lund University, I would like to say thank you to the Karin, of course, and to uh, the opponent and examination committee. You've all done a great work to read and think about this. And... So, uh, thank you. And now uh, we will meet with the examination committee being present on Zoom in room uh, 467 for the group who is uh, going to assess the thesis. And for all others here, you, I think there is a break with maybe some snacks while we're